Shalom. This is Bishop Nathaniel of Israel United in Christ. I want to start off by saying thank you to all of our Booster Club members for your many donations and much more your prayers. We visited faraway countries and strange lands. We've even spoken to dignitaries and were detained for spreading the glorious gospel in Cuba. The truth is that the descendants of the 12 tribes of Israel were scattered throughout the world. Help us on our journey as we continue to raise up the nation of Israel. 12 tribes worldwide. Join or donate today. Shalom. going to talk about uh, four carpenters and the five levels of discipline. The four carpenters and five levels of discipline. Or discipleship. That's the real title. Discipleship. Uh, before we get into it, though, I want to op open up with 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Please. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, <clears throat> excuse me, verse 6. By pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned, mm -hmm. by the word of truth, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. So the Holy Spirit, which is the Holy Ghost, has been sent within each of our hearts and minds. And we must have love unfeigned. Unfeigned love is not phony love. Unfeigned love is not fake love. We got to have that sincere uh, love one for another. Read on. By honor and dishonor. By honor and dishonor. Go ahead. By evil report and good report. Uh-huh. As deceivers and yet true. Now, verse 8. I want to pause right there. Being in this truth and teaching as we've done, amongst our people, we receive honor. However, when it comes to the world or our people outside the truth who follow colonialism, Christianity, colonialism, they make us to appear dishonored. Then it says, by evil report and good report. The evil report comes from those who have, who are outside this truth, those of our people who have not repented, and those of the other nations. They give us an evil report. It says, uh, by evil report and good report. The good report is that we're, we are keeping the commandments. We are trying to unite and unify the 12 tribes of Israel. It says, as deceivers and yet true. What do they say? We're, oh, oh, they're deceivers. They're a cult. The Bible said, but we're yet true. Many times, some of you even in here have, when you first heard the truth years ago, you said, no, nah, that's a cult. I'm not listening to that. But in time, the Most High dropped that awakening spirit on you, you woke up and said, you know what? I was wrong. What these brothers are bringing out is the truth and nothing but the truth. So help me. Read on. Verse 9. As unknown and yet well known. As unknown and yet well, just like in the past, the disciples, it appeared that they, like we, are unknown. But yet we are well known. Don't ever get it twisted. We are well known. In this. I don't care people say, oh, no, I don't know who you're talking about. Israelites, what is that? No, I don't know. That's a lie. They know. They know. Read it again. As unknown and yet well known. Mm -hmm. As dying and behold, we live. Right. As dying and behold, we live. Because, yeah, we're growing old. 
Okay, that time is coming for some of us, but yet we live. Why? Because we have eternal life abiding on us. Go ahead. As chastened and not killed. As chastened. That's what they was getting whipped back then. And not killed. Go ahead. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. Right. No matter what bad things happen or come our way, we must always rejoice. Like I told you sometime uh, last week, shout out Tuesday, the camp in Sierra Leone got... Uh, beat up and arrested by the police. They said, oh, they're trying to overthrow the government, which was a lie. That's what pe- The only way they're going to stop this truth is they're going to do the same way they did to Christ, bring up false accusations, false witnesses. That's what they're going to do. Everybody understand what I'm saying so far? All right, all right. We got to always keep in mind, and I think the Booster Club, because the schools and countries outside of the United States must always be visited. You cannot leave them on their own. Like Dick and Yawasab said, what are the thing, expression you say? This ain't going to run on, on, autopilot. on autopilot. I remember we visited this, uh, one school, uh, Ghana one time. We visited them. This was years ago. And we were out eating and the brothers was putting pork on their plate. And we were like, yo, what's that? That's pork. And the brothers didn't know the difference between clean and unclean. So you can't let things run on autopilot. You can't Assume people understand the scriptures based on just a YouTube video. You must see them face to face. And when you see people say, no, they could just do it on their own, that's poor leadership. When you say, oh, they could just do it themselves. No, they can't. That's why in Acts it said, how can I understand except what? Some man should guide me. Okay? That's what happened. Now, give me the article, not article, the snapshot which, with our friend J. Edgar Hoover. Yeah, put that on the screen. All right, read that. When FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover was asked, what in his opinion was the single greatest threat to the United States of America? He responded, Negro unity. Take a moment to let that sink in. Now, that's a heavy statement. I've read that before, but when you get into the truth, you start to see it with new eyes. You understand what this man is really saying. J. Edgar Hoover, like many of the scholars and the elites of society, understand that in America, here in America, is where the truth is going to go. Give me that in Hosea 1 and 10. Let me show you. They said it's the American black. That's the problem. The Negro. The book of Hosea, (laughs) chapter 1, verse 10. Mm -hmm. Yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, ye are not my people. Why? Because they changed our identity and called us Afro-Americans, for example. Negro, for example. Go ahead. There it shall be said unto them, ye are the sons of the living God. Ye are the sons of the living God. Now, I want to hold that right there. Watch this. Give me uh, Zechariah 12. I'm going to show you about the American. The American Negro. I'm going to show you why J. Edgar Hoover and many of the elite are so hard on the so-called American black man. Read that, Zechariah 12 or 7, please. Zechariah chapter 12. And this is not a shot at the other tribes. Don't get me wrong. I'm just showing you prophecy in the works, how they know what we have now, what we now know. Read that. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 7. The Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first. See that? It says, the Lord also shall save the tents of Judah first. Go ahead. That the glory of the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem do not magnify themselves against Judah. Now, go to Deuteronomy 33. Deuteronomy 33. I want about Judah. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 7. And this is the blessing of Judah. This is the blessing of Judah. This is Moses speaking in the spirit. Go ahead. And he said, hear, Lord, the voice of Judah. Hear, Lord, the voice of Judah. Go ahead. And bring him unto his people. That's letting you know when the Lord would raise Judah first, it would be the tribe of Judah that would go forth to Benjamin, to Levi, to Ephraim, to Manasseh, to Gad, to Reuben. Do you understand that? This is the prophecy. Go ahead. Read it again. And this is the blessing of Judah. And he said, Hear, Lord, the voice of Judah, and bring him unto his people. Mm -hmm. Let his hands be sufficient for him, 
and be thou in help to him from his enemies. And we pray that thing every day that the Lord be a help to us from our enemies. So, J. Edgar Hoover, put it back up on the screen. When he said the greatest threat to the United States of America, he responded, Negro unity. He knew what he was talking about according to the scriptures. That it would be the so-called a Negro to go wake up and unite the tribes of Israel. Bring them, to the get, bring them together to the truth of who and what they truly are. Does everybody understand that? That's why they put a rock on the American black man's back. Always got a foot on the American black man's neck. Why? Because they said, this group here, this is the group that's going to wake up and bring back the truth that they're the Israelites. They said, we ain't worried about the group in Haiti. We ain't worried about the group in Jamaica. And we ain't grew up worried about the group in Africa either. It's this group right here. That's what they knew. I tell you, the white man know the scriptures. Y'all be sleeping on this white man. He might not know everything, but he knows something. He know enough. Okay? So, from there, give me the ADL uh, article, the ADL. Okay. They got extremist sects within the black Hebrew Israelite movement. See, this is crazy. We have not harmed anybody. We've never burned a cross on nobody's lawn. We ain't lynched nobody. What are we doing? Teaching the Bible. Teaching the Bible. And as we've gone over before, myself, Deacon Ithan, from the time of the Greeks, they set laws in place forbidding us to teach our nationality, to even admit that we're the Jews, and from keeping God's holidays. We even showed you in Spain and Portugal, during the 14th, they did the same damn thing. They made it outlawed to call ourselves the Israelites. They said, let's call them something else. That, they were the ones that gave us the name Negro. They said they could call us various other things, okay? That was them. Now, right back there in Spain, they said the Inquisition, they forbid us from keeping God's commandments. They outlawed keeping God's laws. And many times we'll think and go, that could never happen again. Don't be deceived. Now it's this, this uprising of... Once you say you're an Israelite, you're anti-Semitic. Head speech. That's how it begins. That's how it begins. You got white Christians. Okay, you got, what's that bum's name? Reiser, what's his name? Mark Reiser. Mark Reiser. Oh, oh, anti-Semitic. And we open challenge to all of you. Prove the Europeans are Jews according to the Bible. Now, what's so hard about that? Challenge has been open. Okay. When we made the challenge, I believe uh, the Nation of Islam even make a challenge to them. The challenge is there. Prove that you are the people of the book. You can't do it. You just can't do it. That's right. So now it's hate speech. Oh, we got to outlaw them from teaching the Bible the way they teach it. These people are crazy. So go on down. Raise it up. I mean, I keep saying the wrong word. Raise it up. Look at that. Wait, wait. Go back down. Go back down. Not all black Hebrew Israelite organizations are anti-Semitic extremists. And listen, there's no Israelite camp or group that is anti-Semitic. We are Semitic. That's right. The hell, see, this is why they said, no, we can't get them on the news like that because they'll bring out this truth and we're gonna, they're gonna, their faces will be what? Cracked and on the floor. They know that. Go ahead with First Chronicles. Let's see who the Semites are. And especially you Ashkenazis. Ashkenaz was a son of Japheth. Yep. How can you be Japheth and Shem. Jew? Right. At the same day, I'm telling you, bunch of demons. Okay, uh, read that. Ca Captain Amazon. Yes, sir. Black Hebrew Israelites are not the same as black Jews or Jews of color. Not all black Hebrew Israelite organizations are anti-Semitic or extremists. The black Hebrew Israelite movement is divided into organizations or sects that operate semi-independently across the United States. Now, when they throw that term black in there, they're trying to say you're not the original. You're not the true ones. Because when they speak, they say, well, we're, we're the Jews. You're the black Jews. Really? The only Jews are black. Read. Black Hebrew Israelites believe that they are the true Israelites. Well, they didn't lie on that part. Go ahead. And that the 12 tribes of Israel are people of color. Well, at least he told the truth on that part right there. Go ahead. 
popular activities include street teachings and public speaking events. Yep. Mm -hmm. Extremist sects heavily rely on social media to spread information and coordinate activity. Well, we're going to reach a lot of people there. Nobody can hear you else up. That's where they think they got us at. They figure that if they shut down social media, they figure the truth going to stop. You know what that proves? That proves that freedom of speech does not yes. pertain to the Israelites at all. Once you say you're an Israelite now, they call it, they label it hate speech. Okay? So they say, oh, no, no, you're not allowed to say that. Okay. Uh, read on. Background. The black Hebrew Israelite movement is a fringe religious movement that rejects widely accepted definitions of Judaism. Yeah, we do reject that. That's right. And asserts that people of color are the true children of Israel. That's right. Right. Widely accepted definitions still does not mean that it's factual. Right. Just because they've brainwashed the people on this planet outside of the, outside of the truth that the Bible speaks of, they figure that that's going to stand up as truth. Right. Regardless of how much they repeat it, the Bible condemns them. The Bible shuts their lives down. So that's the reason why they don't want the Bible spoken. Exactly. 100% correct. We don't give a daggone about widely accepted definitions of Judaism. They deceive the whole world. Go ahead. Followers who are also referred to as, quote, unquote, black Hebrews. No, we're not referred to as black Hebrews. Go ahead. Or, quote, unquote, Hebrew Israelites. Mm -hmm. Believe that blacks, Hispanics, and Native Americans are the descendants of the 12 tribes of Israel. That, that's true right there. That's right. It ain't that we believe it so we much. We know it. It's in the Bible. Mm -hmm. It's biblical. It should be noted that not all BHI adherents include Native American populations in the 12 tribes. But they all agree that white people are conventionally accepted. Jews are not members of the tribes. Hey, Christ said that in Revelation 2-9. That's right. So it's not coming from us. That's what the Bible says. This yeah. is a departure from the mainstream understanding of the 12 tribes as a reference to Jacob's 12 sons, who each represent a different genealogical thread of the Jewish population. Similarly, adherents of the white supremacist Christian identity movement also claim to be members of the lost tribes of Israel. Yeah, yeah. You see that? Them with us. They're trying to equate us as the opposite of white supremacy. Right. These people are full of BS. Exactly. Go all the way down. I want to read all of this. Go all the way down. Go all the way. Raise it up. Raise it. Raise it. Raise it. Raise it. They even put the sign up there. Mm-hmm. I'm going to get to the camps part. Where is it at? I want to get all the way down when they list the camps. They go through a whole lot of rhetoric right here. So they got number one active extremist factions. You see this? Now what active extremist faction or what have we done? But speak the truth. They got us numero uno. Did I say that right? Northern Kingdom? Numero uno? Okay. Raise it up. Raise it up. Let's see who, who uh, number two is. Oh, they got IS, ISUPK as number two. Number two. That might, I hope that don't piss them off. That might offend them that they're number two. Well, they can have number one if they want. We ain't, we ain't, we ain't jockeying for position. Raise it up. Number three. No, raise it up. Let's see who number three is. Sakari. No, 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 they they came from GMS. Why ain't GMS on there? So this is number three. Raise it up. Yeah, company, company was there. Number four is uh, what? True nation. I can't even. See. Can you raise lower so I can see? True nation, Israelite congregation, aka True Nation. That's number four. Okay, raise it up. They what? Are they apart? They got brothers' pictures on there. Like they got me all on there. Go ahead. What the hell is this? Is that it? There was nobody else? Wait a minute. Go back up. I saw some names. It was, it was Comfy. I thought Comfy's group yeah, was, was on there. there. Where are they? No, go up. It's, it's up. You missed it. Raise it. 
that group Keep is going. So no, you passed it. I just Raise go down, up. go down a little bit, go down a little bit more. All Is right, that there. It right there. Israelite Church of God and Jesus Christ. They don't got them in bold letters. So go to the bottom. Oh yeah, they slander us with brushes to the law. Of course, they bring out the Joy Morgan incident and the other dude that was put out and he shot someone in the face. Anything to sully? Why don't? Why don't now? Timothy McVeigh there was a go. Christian. Right. Roman he Cat killed devout. almost 300 people at right. one time. The federal building. The right. FBI should be, be looking at the Catholic. Exactly. Why aren't they looking at the Catholic Church? Babies and everything. Exactly. They got Nation of Yahweh. That's Yahweh Ben Yahweh. Back in the 80s, they put them up there just to sully our name before the public. That's why I started off earlier with 2 Corinthians 6 right. about evil report and good report. Because what we're doing for the community, for our people, right. is of a good report. Exactly. But uh, uh, when you look at the news media, right. it's all their evil. Right. They, they want to hurt people. They're a bunch of liars, you. Bunch of damn liars. All right, you can take that off the screen now. You can take that off the screen. So, many of you know that uh, our brother, uh, what's his name? Amari Stoudemire, he's very upset. Omari Stoudemire is very upset, and he's, he felt very insulted. Now, he's our brother. We do love our brother. But, and he made a statement. He said that he was the first celebrity to say that he was an Israelite. But that's not true. Omari Stoudemire, we love you, bro. But we're gonna, we had to fact check you on that. No. You had Deacon Ace have brought up Sammy Davis Jr. Brought it out. And now put Yafet up there. Yafet Koda, that's his name. Now raise it up. Go down to early life. Right there. Click early life. Uh, raise it up. Let me see something. Raise it up. Raise it up. Right, stop right there. Start right there, according to Kodo. According to Kodo, his father was an observant Jew who spoke Hebrew. Kodo's mother, who was a Panaman of Panamanian descent, converted to Judaism before marrying his father. Kodo claims that his great-grandfather, whom he names King Alexander Bell, ruled the Dula region of Cameroon in the 19th century and was also a practicing Jew. Notwithstanding, the lack of evidence connecting his own family to the Bells, the extent of the Bell rule seems overstated by Kodo, and the claim of Jewishness also is little supported by the historical record. Kodo has said You're that. Trying to say his line, right. What? But this is the part we wanted to get right, to. Right, right. What Kodo. historical record do the so called Jews have that they're the Jews? Right. None. That's it. They have no. Read. Kodo has said that his paternal family originated from Israel many centuries ago, uh -huh. migrating to Egypt and then Cameroon, and have, been, uh, and have been African Jews for many generations. Now, notice this. Kodo said his paternal family originated from Israel. Many centuries ago, he's referring to 70 AD, migrating to Egypt and then Cameroon. Okay, but, well, he started to do research on himself. He found out that he was an Israelite. Our brother, um, Amari Stoudemire, was not the first celebrity to say or admit that he was an Israelite or a Jew. Boys to Men was with Comfy's Camp, uh, Killer Priest, that was, he was from the old school with us. Okay, so, uh, Amari Stoudemire, we do love you. And our only problem with you is that you have joined the people that enslaved your ancestors and stole your ancestors' identity. That is the only issue we have with you. Okay, so, and we've been, again, like, was you trying to call him? So we had brothers we tried to reach out to by phone. A deacon ate try to reach him. He sent a phone number. He refuses to pick up the phone. Damn. Instead, he, he, he puts a whole thing on Twitter. It's fine. It's fine. But we do love you, bro. We have no hatred or animosity to you. Our prayer is that you repent. That's it. Right. So, with all the hate that we get coming our way. See, as long as you... Give me that in Proverbs. Uh, though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not go unpunished. Give me that one. Everybody's going to get their judgment. Everyone's going to get, every nation is going to get their just judgment. The book of Proverbs, chapter 11, 
verse 21. Though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished. The wicked shall, though hand join in hand, the wicked shall not be unpunished. So it don't matter. You holding hands with your oppressor, jumping up and down with a black hat on and a black suit. Bruh, judgment is coming for them. That's right. the, that land over there is our land. They're going to be blown to hell and back according to the Holy Bible. I hope you understand that. Okay. Give me, hold on, let me look. Something just popped in my mind. Give me <clears throat> Jeremiah, I think, chapter 25 and verse 29. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 25, verse 29. For lo, I begin to bring evil on the city. So God began to bring evil on the city of Israel, the city of Jerusalem. Go ahead. Which is called by my name. That's Jerusalem. Go ahead. And should ye be utterly unpunished? And should ye be utterly unpunished, meaning these other nations. If God's chosen people got punished and put into slavery, and he's, shall these other nations go unpunished? Read. Ye shall not be unpunished. Ye shall not be unpunished. Go ahead. For I will call for a sword upon all the inhabitants of the earth. Saith the Lord of hosts. That's why I was saying every nation that put their dirty, filthy hand on us will be punished. That's right. And that includes the so-called white man in the land of Israel. They're going to get judged, too, because we are the apple of God's eye. Now, before we can really deal with them, give me that in Psalms 50, please. Psalms 50. Uh, is it 50 or 55 where it says I will set them in order? I want that one. Okay. Psalms 50 verse 20. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother. So Esau has spoken against his brother Jacob. And the brotherly covenant was broken, by the way. Go ahead. Thou slanderest thine own mother's son. That's what the ADL has done, is doing. That's what the SPLC is doing. Go ahead. These things hast thou done. And I kept silence. God kept silent. While they slandered us, changed our identities, called us Negroes, niggers, spicks, whatever you name. You name it, they call it to us. Go ahead. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such and one as thyself. They said, surely God's a white man. Look what we've done to these people. There has been no judgment. God is a white man. And they have painted God white for the past few centuries. Go ahead. But I will reprove God thee. God comes back. The Lord says, I will reprove thee. I will Judge you, correct you, go ahead. And set them in order before thine eyes. Now that's the part we wanted right there. Set them in order before thine eyes. God's about order. God is about order. Everything must be done decently and in order. We cannot deal with the nations effectively until we deal with ourselves. Everybody understand that? We always, we always, like you hear many of our people talk about black economics. We need economics! You cannot have successful economics as a nation. Listen good to what I'm saying. As a nation, until we effectually deal with our... Uh, our sense. Our sense of mm, immorality. Uh, uh, civility. We got we to gotta handle that within ourselves. How you gonna, here, if I'm a thief, God forbid, how are you going to do a business with me? I might steal everything you put in the bank account. What the hell is this? So these things, these God's laws must be taught to us and applied daily. And yes, sometimes it's a bumpy road. Okay? Sometimes there's a bumpy road. But again, before we can effectually deal with the nations, we must deal with ourselves. Meaning what? Get ourselves in order. In order with what? In order with God's words, with what he's saying. Okay, understand that thing. I hope everyone understands that. Give me Job 32. A brother that was with us, thank God he ain't with us no more. He's the one, he says, uh, I don't want to listen to Captain Shem. I said, what do you mean? What's going on? He says, Shem keeps me from doing my work. I said, really? He said, if you made me a captain, I wouldn't have to listen to Captain Shem. <laughs> so I said, well, you want to be a captain? Is that it? He says, Yes. I said, well, how about this? We're going to make you the grand poobah. And I went, shazam! You are the grand poobah, brother. Captain of one million. How do you feel? Uh, I'm still listening. Exactly. I said, listen, bruh, bruh, 
Bruh. Stop. You got to stop the foolishness, all right? We hate order. We hate order. That's what we witnessed in 2018. Oh, can I stand up for a minute? Stand up. Out of all that evil, this is the only man that repented and stayed in his truth. That's right. Put the camera on him. All praises, all praises. That's right. Let's stand up for the brother. Stand up for him. All praises, all praises. So that's why we don't give a damn what the wicked say. All we need is one soul to repent. And we was waiting for some of them to repent. Mm -mm, Lord said, don't hold your breath. Not near one of them. Hey, did the black hacker repent? He ain't never repent. None of them repented. Damn! They fun fighting amongst themselves? Wow, wow. Now, let me tell you something. Uh, regarding, God is always about order. Give me that in Titus 1 and 5 or 6. You know what I'm talking about. But you don't want Job 32? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I forgot, yeah. Grand Poobah. Grand, this was Grand Poobah scripture. Job 32, 21. Job, this is check. for brothers that run around and you want rank. Listen, in New York... Yes, New York, I'm talking about you. When how many brothers got deranked in New York for cheating? Huh? Qu quite a few. Listen, let me tell you the danger of cheating. Do you know that we set men like officers of 50 and to judge matters? And if you have been cheating, you did not just, you did, give me the right words so I don't curse nobody out. You, you, you have a rank undeserving and you don't know how to judge accurately or properly. You will judge matters like marriage situations or whatever situation, and judge wrong and destroy people's lives. Do y'all understand that? So it's very serious. We got to take this very seriously, okay? And like we, we, when we came in, there was no open Bible test. You had to memorize everything. That's why I was good back then. I ain't good now. I'd be like, hey, find me that because I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Somebody get it for me. <laughs> Tell you the truth. But back then, no, no open book, uh-uh. Straight off the dome, memory, memory. Okay, Job 32, 21. Job chapter 32, verse 21. Let me not, I pray you, accept any man's person. Neither let me give flattering titles unto man. Let me not give flattering titles unto man. Why? Go ahead. <clears throat> For I know not to give flattering titles. In so doing, my maker would soon take me away. God will destroy you, because where the flattering title comes partiality he's my friend so i will judge differently for him okay he's 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 an officer of such a, he's a captain he's this, he's a bishop of D. i'm gonna judge differently for him that's called a flattering title we don't want you men that have that mindset you know brothers call a lot and one brother did he said to me he said uh he said i've been in this truth five years he said and i have stayed no, how long you been in? Eight years. Eight years. Eight years. He said he's been a soldier for eight years. So I said, well, why is that? I said, you messing up over there? You just effed up? He says, no. He said, have you heard anything negative about me? I said, me personally, no. I said, but I would have to speak to the captains over you. He said, I've been in this truth so long. He said, what about men over you who don't want you to excel? I said, hmm. I said, that is a possibility. We have some grimy people among us. This is something they got in Esau's, they call in Esau's world, job security. Remember, we went through that in New York. I ain't bashing you in New York. I'm just telling you what happened. We wanted a, we, one man cannot run the show. So one brother had a particular skill. So we said, listen, we need you to train five other brothers on this thing. He refused to do, he did not, he would give them a little bit, but not show them the whole thing. Captain Zephyr, you know what I'm talking about, right? That's called job security. In other words, that's called evil. So that, that way, you will always have to depend on moi. No, nah, that's evil as hell. That is some evil stuff. And black people do that. And when I say black, I'm talking about you Latinos too, because the brother I'm talking about, Piki Bani, Mita Mita, he didn't want to help nobody. He said, no, 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 I don't want to train nobody. It's just me. It's just me. That's an evil spirit. Okay, we got to each one teach one. This is about nation building. Everybody understand that? Nation building. Read on, Captain. Job chapter 32, verse 22. For I know not to give flattering titles. In so doing, my maker would soon take me away. Right. That goes, you know what the precepts that? Find me the script. I don't know where it is. I'll be honest. 
is at, it might be Jude or Peter where it says, having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Jude chapter 6, verse 16. These are murmurers, complainers, walking after their own lusts, and their mouths speak of great swelling words. Having men's purses in admiration because of advantage. Right. That goes with what we just read in Job. Having men's persons in admiration because of advantage. Or oh, you're an officer of 50, I'm going to be good friends with you. You're a captain, I'm going to be good friends with you and make sure I get my way. That too is an evil spirit. Be very mindful, brothers. That's why I'm glad y'all come up with the new uh, ranking system. And it includes a lot of things, including your wives. Because some of you have rank in your wife is the devil the Bible speaks of. <laughs> she hate you, she hate the kids, and she hate God. And I'm like, why does this dude got a rank? What the hell is going on here? He don't fit First Timothy, the third chapter. And what you're going to realize, we're not like the other, our brothers in the other Israelite camps. We don't just throw rank out like skittles, okay? You must be deserving and comply with what the scriptures say. Okay, um, something I was going to say. And we don't give out rank above our, our numbers. And what I mean by that, here you are, you have a congregation of 200 people. But you are a captain of 7,000, a captain of 10,000, and there's only 200 people in your camp? That makes no sense. Do you understand that? That's stupidity. Utter stupidity. That's flattering titles. Your whole camp is 200, but you are a captain of 10,000. Why don't you just go all the way? Captain of 1 million. Just do that. It's simple as hell. Give you really have to think about that statement. You, try, you, you have a rank of 200. Mm. And I mean, no, you have a rank of 2 million, 200,000. But you only have 100 men. You, do you know what comes with 1,000 people? 1,000 problems. You have to be able to deal with a thousand problems, but you only have 200 to practice with, so to speak. That makes no sense. No sense at all. Exactly. Read that. Titus uh, 1. Verse and, what? Uh, what is it? 5. The book of Titus, chapter 1, verse 5. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city. So when we set ranking, people go, oh, there's no rank in the New Testament. Well, that's, we just read it right there. The elders, this is a generic word which covers soldiers, officers, captains, uh, deacons, bishops, so forth, and so on. That's what this is talking about. Give me that in Colossians 2 and 6. 2 and 5, I'm sorry. Colossians 2 verse 5. The book of Colossians chapter 2 and verse 5. For though I be absent in the flesh, yet am I with you in the spirit, joying and beholding your order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ. So Paul was always instituting order in the various congregations. That's the same path that we're on today. Go to um, Romans 12, please. Rom Romans 12, verse 6 and 7. The book of Romans, chapter 12, verse 6. I don't want none of you pushing or trying to force your way into a rank or a position that you're not ready for. That's dangerous not only to you, but to us, to the body. If you try to force or manipulate your way into a seat of authority that you're not able to fit or fulfill. Read that. Verse 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. You see that? Let us prophesy according to the proportion of faith. So when we go through the Bible and teach, prophesy according to your proportion of faith. Meaning what? You may be only able to prophesy, uh, for example, let's say Deuteronomy 28 uh, or John 3.16. You can explain that. Or give me another one. Give me another one. Revelation, uh, Revelation 1. one. Let's say that. Don't delve into things that's beyond your strength, that you have not sat down and studied, because then you, on video you sound very silly. Okay, don't do that. If somebody asks you a question on it, you sound foolish. So it's a pro pro prophesy according to the proportion of faith. Read. Or ministry. Or ministry, go ahead. Let us wait 
on our ministering. See that on ministry, let us wait on our ministry. That's why the men of valor has been set up to teach you patience. Then from there, when you become a soldier, you're, that patience is to be enacted within you. And to be patient, because what's the new law, rule now y'all got? Two years? You got to be two or three years in your, in your respective rank. That should teach you patience and humility. Tenure. Tenure, thank you. Rather than, oh, I want to I be, be a captain yesterday. Okay? And then you destroy everybody's life. Okay? Uh, give me verse, no, read on, verse 7 again. Or he that teacheth on teaching. Right, some brothers don't, hey, when we started teaching, how long did they give us to teach? 15 minutes, that was it. So you got 15 minutes to teach. That's it. That's all we had. Right. And then they say you got five minutes left, two minutes, and that was it. So when I hear brothers talk, it gave me a long time to, oh, be quiet, bro. Just wait. And even before that, that was years. Because we had the whole post. We used to have the whole post first before you even get to read. Yeah, then you became a reader. Before you came up to speak. So that was years. That was years. You didn't just get up there. Exactly. You had the whole post. Whole post in the back first. Mm -hmm. You couldn't even be on the front. Exactly. You had the whole post in the back. Then you moved, graduated to the front, so to speak, where you could be beside the elders and all that. Exactly. exactly. Then you get to read. That took time. Mm -hmm. So that we're bringing this out to help you, you brothers, get your minds right. Get your minds correct. Give me um, 2 Timothy 2 and 5. So... Prophesy according to your proportion of faith. Um, if you're going to minister, sometimes you have to wait when you're ministering or teaching. Wait on that. Be patient. Can right? I say something, Bishop? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, that's, that's where a lot of you brothers be coming up with heresies and so forth. Because you're going beyond your understanding and bringing out stuff that you, you, you can't handle. You understand? You start going into deep stuff. You might see the bishop going to some heavy or you might see... One of us going to some heavy and you trying to do the same thing when you are not able to. You understand? Then you come up with some dumb doctrine and start spreading it in the congregation. That's right. That's why the scriptures say minister according to how much the level that was given to you. You know, you brothers understand that. Yep. Let's go to Second Timothy 2 5. Y'all so you gonna say something? Yeah, it's, it's heavy what Deacon Malachi brought out and, and he's extending on what, what Bishop just brought out. Because a lot of times when we be bringing these, deep, these books out, everybody want to fly and try to get the book right away. And they haven't even studied the basics yet because they want to look deep. They want to sound deep. What did you shy you tell us about I was about just about to say it. I said, you mess around and buy a book and open it and a demon fly out, now you're confused. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Because so your mom always yeah. say that. Yeah. He said, like, open you know up the what? book. <laughs> There's, there are books made of human flesh. That, yeah, he talked about that one. And on the cover, it's human flesh, and there's a vagina on it. There's, a, there's real that. books like that. I, 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 That's I why I said, say be that careful one. with some of these books. You open up a damn demon jump on you. Oh, shoot, what happened to him? Then you're all bugged out. Mm -hmm. Walking backwards all around the corner. Damn. How is this? We've seen this. We've seen it. 2 Timothy 2 and 5. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5. And if, any, if a man also strive for masteries... If a man strive for masteries, meaning you want to move up in, yet your, is he, in, a, in rank... Go ahead. Yet is he not crowned... Yet is he not crowned... Except he strive lawfully. You see that? Except he strive lawfully. We must do things lawfully to be um, recognized by God and man. We must strive lawfully. Don't do things... What are they, when you try to throw somebody under the bus to make yourself look good, yeah. don't. There's little things that I see that brothers have done, and it's not according to the Most High God at all. Okay, from there, from there, give me the book of Nehemiah. Strive lawfully. So in New York, they didn't, they, they weren't crowned here on Earth because of some of them were cheating. Underhandedly, not realizing the danger behind that. Okay. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 27. The book of Nehemiah, chapter 9, verse 27. Therefore, thou deliverest 
them into the hand of their enemies. Therefore who, thou delivered them, the Israelites, into the hand of their enemies. Good. Who vexed them. Who vexed them. We're in the hand of our enemy, and our enemy is vexing us. Go ahead. And in the time of their trouble. And in the time of their trouble. Go ahead. When they cried unto thee, mm-hmm. thou heardest them from heaven. And according to thy manifold mercies, thou gavest them saviors. Who saved them out of the hand of their enemies. So what I want you to see that in every captivity, Nehemiah is prophesying, God sent saviors. He sent saviors to help and deliver the children of Israel from the constant vexation of their enemies. Believe it or not, brothers, y'all them saviors today. Let's give yourselves a hand on that. Now I know some of you don't believe that. I know some of you don't believe it, like Deacon Malachi was saying, but we're going to touch on it. We're going to show you that thing. We're going to show you that today. Zechariah chapter 1. Let's start at verse 12, please. The book of Zechariah chapter 1, verse 12. Then the angel of the Lord answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how long wilt thou not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the cities of Judah, against which thou hast had indignation these three score and ten years? These 70 years from the time of Babylon. Go ahead. And the Lord answered the angel that talked with me with good words and comfortable words. So the Lord answered the angel with good words and comfortable words. Go ahead. So the angel that communed with me said unto me, Cry thou, saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I am jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion with a great jealousy. So God is jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion. Remember, Jerusalem and Zion is a people before it's a place. Go ahead. And I am Very sore displeased with the heathen that are at ease. And God is very upset with the nations that are at ease. Go ahead. For I was but a little displeased, and they helped forward the affliction. I'm going to give an example today. Today's time. When we got emancipated here in the United States of America, right after the emancipation, they set up what's called the Ku Klux Klan. And they did more evil to us, okay, and set up new agricultural laws. They helped forward the affliction. That's what they did. Read. 16, verse 16. Therefore, thus saith the Lord, I am returned to Jerusalem with mercies. My house shall be built in it. So he was prophesying that the temple was going to be rebuilt. Go ahead. Saith the Lord of hosts. And a line shall be stretched forth upon Jerusalem. Uh Cry yet, saying, thus saith the Lord of hosts. My cities through prosperity shall yet be spread abroad. And the Lord shall yet comfort comfort Zion and shall yet choose Jerusalem. Right, because he has set up during this time, King Cyrus was set up to release the Israelites, to rebuild the temple. This is what was happening. Go ahead. Then lifted up mine eyes and saw, and behold, four horns. He saw four horns. Go ahead. And I said unto the angel that talked with me, what be these? And he answered me. These are the horns which have scattered Judah, Israel, and Jerusalem. So the four horns, write this down. Babylon, Persia Media, Greece, and Rome. Those are the four horns. Babylon, Persia Media, Greece, and Rome. Read. Verse 20. And the Lord showed me four carpenters. And the Lord showed me four carpenters. Go ahead. Then said I. What come these to do? And he spake, saying, These are the horns which have scattered Judah. That's the horns again. Babylon, Persia, Media, Greece, and Rome. Go ahead. So that no man did lift up his head. But these are come to fray them. But these are come to fray them. Meaning what? The carpenters are come to fray them. Write this down. Who are the carpenters? In each captivity, God always sent saviors. Like we read in Nehemiah 9, 27. During the time of Babylon, he had Daniel. Write that down. Daniel was during the time of Babylon. During the time of Persia media, you had Zerubbabel. And there were many people with Zerubbabel, but I'm just naming him because he gets mentioned quite a bit in the book of Zechariah. During the time of the Greeks, you had Judah Maccabee and his brethren with him. And during the time of Rome was prophesied to come Christ and the 12 apostles. So read verse 21 again. Verse 21. Then said I, what come these to do? And he spake, saying, these are the horns which have scattered Judah, so that no man did lift up his head. But these are come to fray them, 
to cast out the horns of the Gentiles, mm -hmm. which lifted up their horn over the land of Judah to scatter it. So the Lord always sent saviors. He always sent saviors to comfort the people, to help the people. All right. So now when, during the time of Babylon, we had our brother Daniel. Let's look at Daniel 1 and 4. I just want to look at a few attributes of forefather Daniel. The book of Daniel, chapter 1 and verse 5. I went 4. Verse 4. Children in whom was no blemish, mm -hmm. but well favored and skillful in all wisdom and cunning in knowledge and understanding science and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace and whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. So, read on. I'm going to come back to verse 4, but read on. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, that at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now among these were of the children of Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Go ahead. Unto whom the prince of the eunuchs gave names. For he gave unto Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, and to Hananiah of Shadrach, and to Mishael of Meshach, and to Azariah of Abednego. So what I want you to see regarding Daniel and the brothers with him, look at verse 4 again. Read verse 4 again. Verse 4. Children in whom was no blemish. Daniel had a ruddy complexion. They had no blemish, no pimples, no, what is that called? No hyperpigmentation which is discoloration in the skin, perfect complexion. Go ahead. But well-favored. Well-favored. Go ahead. And skillful. Right, they were black and beautiful. Thank you. Right, go ahead. And skillful in all wisdom. Daniel was wise. Go ahead. And cunning in knowledge. And he was cunning in knowledge. And understanding and, science. And understanding science. Go ahead. And such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace. So he had etiquette. He knew how to conduct himself on a royal level. Go ahead. And whom they might teach the learning and the tongue of the Chaldeans. So these attributes Daniel had from a young man. Look at chapter 2 and verse 23. Daniel chapter 2 and verse 23. Mm -hmm. I thank thee and praise thee, O thou God of my fathers, who has given me wisdom and might, and has made known unto me now what we desired of thee. For thou, for thou hast now made known unto us the king's matter. Daniel had such a connection with the Most High that the Holy Spirit was on in him. He was able to understand and see a dream that the king himself had forgotten. So Daniel had an excellent, write this down, prayer life. Daniel had an excellent prayer life. From there, give me verse 47. Verse 47. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. Then the king made Daniel a great man, and gave him many great gifts, and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon, mm -hmm. and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Right. Hey, give me, this, give me the one where Daniel prayed three times a day. The book of Daniel, chapter 6, verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in his chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he did aforetime. Sometimes we think that the Muslims came up with that. No, they got that from our forefather, Daniel. They mimicked our forefather who prayed three times a day. And King David did the same thing too when you read in the Psalms. Pray three times a day. So all of us, we definitely got to step up our prayer life with the Most High. Okay? From there, give me uh, 1 Ezra chapter 3. Now, that was in Babylon. I want to jump up to Persia media dealing with Zerubbabel. Give me 1 Ezra chapter 3 and verse 4. The book of 1 Ezra chapter 3 verse 4. Then three young men that were of the guard that kept the king's body. Spake one to another. So these were bodyguards for the king of Persia. Okay. I believe it was Darius. Yes. Time of Darius. Jump over to verse 12. Verse 12. The third wrote, women are strongest, but above all things, truth beareth away 
the victory. That the third was Zerubbabel. I'm just jumping some key points I want to just pull out. I mean, I'm sure most of you, most of you should have read this before, but in case you didn't, the king gave a contest and said, whoever gives the wisest sentence, he would make him top man, give him riches and answer, deal with whatever he wanted, he would give it to him. So Zerubbabel was the third of the king's bodyguard. So I want you to think about that. Remember, Zerubbabel was an Israelite of the tribe of Judah. He was the Persian king's bodyguard. How'd that happen? You got to think about it. He had to have some qualities that some of us may not have. Number one is loyalty. Number two is he had to know how to do what? Strategize. I know you ain't thinking that word. Strategize. He's the but he's the king's. Today they call King's bodyguard the Secret Service. If something pop off, where are we gonna take? Where he's gonna go? He had to know how to fight number three. So Zerubbabel could not have been a wuss like Deacon Malachi said. Wuss is that the word you use? What does that word mean? Wuss. He could not have been a wuss. Okay. So when we, during the men of valor. When we have brothers training, it's not for no reason. We see some, we've seen some of y'all pa- almost pass out today. Right, right. Some of you big body brothers, you know who you are. Breathing heavy, screaming, throw water on me! The hell is going on here? <laughs> my left, my left, my left, right. Left. <laughs> oh, God, help me. Carry me, somebody carry my fat behind. <laughs> the hell is this? Zerubbabel was not one of those guys. So these are the things you got to look at the forefathers, emulate them, and say, you know what? I want to pattern myself like these guys. They wasn't huffing and puffing, getting tired. Let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a story. We was in Haiti, and we went into the Voodoo Fest. And it, the Voodoo Fest was like down in a, uh, uh, was it a valley? What was that down there? Like a valley, all the way down. No problem. We went down there with ease. Taught, blah, 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 Bobby Bouvet, blah, Bobby Boucher, blah, 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 blah. Bobby Boucher. <laughs> C'est passé. So now we had to go up the valley. And we walking, and we all going, I didn't realize we was that low. And we walking, I'm starting to get tired as hell. I'm starting to breathe heavy. I said, I can't stop. I said, you know what? I don't want nobody to know I'm tired. But the security... My good brother, Mickey L., he started going to the left and right. Somebody throw water on me. Ah! I said, you tired, Mickey L., thank God for you. I said, I need to help Mickey L. I'm tired as hell. I'm leaning on him like, oh, oh. <laughs> So what the hell is this? So we stayed down there another 10 minutes with them crazy Haitians down there, throwing blood and guts around and slinging it. What the hell was wrong with them people? But after that, I said, you know what? I, I can't be like that no more. But then it did happen again with you on Feast of Tabernacles. Y'all saw got out of breath. I said, thank God he's tired. Because I was tired as hell. I leaned on him. I'm going to help you, y'all. So I'm going to stay here with you. Everybody stay with me with y'all. So. <laughs> I said, I can't go. I, mm-mm, mm-mm, no more, no more. We be one of them guys, Captain Shem, yelling at on. You know who you are, Captain Shem. Be yelling at you. You be mad as hell, but you ain't doing nothing. He calling you all kind of fat and damn. This guy, he see you scratching. Who that scratching his nose over there? The hell is going on here? We used to train with Captain Shem, but he was embarrassing leadership too much. We had to stop. What the hell is this wrong with this guy? Just give him the young man. I ain't training with this dude. <laughs> but we've been getting us see so, see you get we get when when the most I jacked us up with that damn corona crap Lord, hey y'all better start eating better you better start doing the right exercise oh lord hey that's what the scriptures say all things work together for good to them that what they love god you be like i don't see nothing good out of corona say so it'll, it'll teach you a lesson stop eating all them hamburgers some of you in here were lactating right now as we speak. Damn. Anyway, give me a <laughs> give me First Ezra chapter four and verse thirteen. So, uh, 
The forefather of Zerubbabel, which was one of the, he was number three of the bodyguards, they was in that group called the Immortals. If you ever watched 300, they're the Immortals. Zerubbabel was one of them guys. Okay. So, First Ezra chapter 4, let's start at verse 13, please. I just, we're well, going through this just to show you some of the qualities that the leadership had in the past. Go ahead. First Ezra chapter 4, verse 13. Mm-hmm. Then the third, who had spoken of women and of the truth, this was Zerubbabel, began to speak. Right, because remember, again, in case you forgot, because some of you might be slow, the king wanted to know what is the strongest thing on earth. One, the first guy said wine, the second guy said the king, but Zerubbabel said women and the truth are the strongest things on earth. So now, verse 13 again. Verse 13, then the third, who had spoken of women and of the truth, this was Zerubbabel, began to speak. O ye men, it is not the great king, nor the multitude of men, neither is it wine that excelleth. Who is it then that ruleth them, or have the lordship over them? Are they not women? Women have borne the king and all the people that bear rule by sea and land. Even of them came they, and they nourished them up that planted the vineyards, from whence the wine cometh. These also make garments for men. These bring glory unto men. And without women cannot men be. You always hear a church lady say that. Y'all ain't nothing without us. Eh, Well, Zerubbabel did say that you bring glory, women bring glory to men, and without women cannot men be, because that was the law. That's why you know ain't no damn immaculate conception. Without women cannot men be. And he, notice he said, these bring glory unto men. And sisters, I know you ain't here with us sisters, but when we say that women are a trophy, you are a trophy. We want, who wants, who wants an ugly woman? Raise your hand, let me see. Ain't no hands up. Don't nobody want an ugly woman, sister. Every man wants, it says, these bring glory. When you walk in with your wife, you want people to go. <laughs> did I do good? Yeah, you did good, brother. Right there. Uh huh. Oh, praise to the Lord. Hey. Yeah, yeah, Bishop, you got to be. Ain't no fasting tonight. Bishop, you got to be clear. Yeah, yeah you got to be clear. You got this. They don't mean an ugly woman cannot find a man. Right, that you don't mean. They will say, they will, you know how yeah, yeah. Some down. women got low self esteem. Let me be nice. Ugly women could get a man. You know, and you sisters, I don't want to change the topic, but since we're talking about women right, right now, you're going to come on patient saying so, but you and a husband. I think you might want to jog around a block a few times before you get on patient saints radio. And I, we try not to hurt nobody's feelings. I remember one sister got on the show. I'm not going to call her names. She's about three of Deacon Malachi over there, three of him. And I asked, I said, do you work out? Yes. You know, I looked at her. I wanted to say, you are a goddamn lawyer. I just sat there. I had to bite my tongue. I said, Lord, give me strength. This sister in here lying to us. Some of these women just want the D. I'm telling you, men, they just want the D. You don't want them type of women. You want a woman with a good head on her shoulders. Not just a big button to smile. I mean, a big button to smile is nice, but she got to have substance. But let me get off the women. We're talking about men right now. Verse 18. Verse 18. Yea, and if men have gathered together gold and silver, or any other goodly thing, do they not love a woman which is comely in favor and beauty? Listen, you brothers that get you gather gold and silver. Some of y'all got you have you married and you end up getting and you see your wife got issues, but then you get a joint bank account with her and put all your money in that account. Then she gets the full depths of Satan on her and clean you out. She got the depths of Satan. Take all your cheddar. You, now you mad. I say, bro, didn't I tell you to not have a joint bank account? Now I'm not saying all joint bank accounts is wrong. I'm not saying that. You got to know your woman. That's all I'm saying. Make sure that in that, if, if you're going to have a joint bank account, have that for the money for the bills. How about that? And say, hey, babe, pay these bills this week. I'll put it in a joint bank account, all right? 
but make sure you got your own. Do everybody understand what I'm saying? Some of y'all make that grievous mistake. And then when she want to destroy you, she take everything. Oh, I learned my lesson. Oh, I, oh, I learned my lesson. Read on. Verse 19. And letting all those things go, do they not gape? And even with open mouth, fix their eyes fast on her? That's how a lot of you thirst. That's a thirsty brother right there. Some of you brothers, regardless of your rank, are thirsty. Your mouth is gaped open. It says, with open mouth and drool. Fix their eyes fast on her. That's what David did with Bathsheba. Go ahead. And have not all men more desire unto her than unto silver or gold or any goodly thing whatsoever? Read. A man leaveth his own father that brought him up and his own country and cleaveth unto his wife. Right. That's from the time of Adam and Eve. Um, Therefore shall a man leave father and mother cleave to his wife and the twain shall be one flesh. Read. He sticketh not to spend his life with his wife. That's why, like it says in Tobit, it says, mercifully ordain that we go what? Grow old together. So if you see a sister and you got to imagine yourself, can I grow old with your sister? If she got a nagging nature right now, you better pump the brakes. If she's nagging you now and you ain't even married yet, don't marry her. You better wait. I remember there's a brother. I ain't going to call his name. He's sitting in here now. <laughs> We did a class on don't be a bum. The sister who he is, was courting sent him a text message. A bishop was speaking about don't be a bum, and that reminds me of you. Damn. So the brother was hot as hell. He said, and he showed me a list of texts that she would daily insult him. I said, you want to marry this? No, he cut her off now. Thank God for counsel. Thank God for counsel. So when people say, oh, he destroyed my... No, I'll, I'll try and catch it before you get married. And all that, get that thing done. Cut that out. She ain't marriage material. Read on. Verse 21. 21, go ahead. He sticketh not to spend his life with his wife, and remembereth neither father nor mother nor country. Right, you forget everything for this woman, go ahead. By this also ye must know that women have dominion over so you. So Rubabel says women got dominion over you. Go ahead. Do ye not labor and toil? And give and bring all to the woman. See, and that's some of you brothers in here. You do all that work and labor and toil to get this woman. Go ahead. Yea, a man taketh his sword and goeth his way to rob and to steal, to sail upon the sea and upon rivers, mm-hmm. and looketh upon a lion and goeth in darkness. And when he hath stolen, spoiled, and robbed, he bringeth it to his love. Do all this thing for the woman. This is what Zerubbabel is saying. The woman is one of the strongest things on earth. But our sisters, I don't know, rather than use that, 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 that power for good, a lot of them use it for evil and wickedness. Go ahead. Wherefore, a man loveth his wife better than father or mother. Here it comes now. Yea, many there be that have run out of their wits for women. And become servants for their sake. Now this right here, this type of brother, let me tell you, this is a scary brother. God can't really use you in the ministry at all. It says you have ran out of your wits for women and have become servants for their sake. Wow. Huh? Yeah, like Ahab. Go ahead. Many also have perished, have erred, and sinned for women. You see that many also have perished? You know what I mean, perished? They killed themselves for a woman. I, hey, I might die for a lot, but for a woman, that ain't going to be one of them. You know how many women is out here in this world, brothers? You killing yourself over one snaggle tooth ratchet hood rat. Are you insane? I just went, I'm a, what happened, bro? I took a whole bottle of pills. Oh, God. And he's vomiting all over the place. I can't breathe without her. You're crazy. That is crazy. You're insane. You don't need to be in the ranks. You need to just be a member. Sit down and just relax. Verse 27. Many also have perished, have erred, and sinned for women. You see that? Many also have perished, meaning you got killed or killed yourself, have erred, meaning you erred in the faith, and sinned for women. You got a situation going on, and you see your wife is dealing with it totally against the scriptures. And you, you, like Ahab, he allowed his wife to uh, kick out. Who are the two people they kicked out of the house? No, remember the brother. They, she hired two false witnesses. 
Naboth, lied on him. Yeah, in the vineyard, thank you, the vineyard. And had him cast out and put to death. Some of y'all are like that in here. You see your wife with doing the wrong judgments, but you don't say nothing. Then that same wicked woman turn around and bite you like a scorpion. And now you're praying to the Lord, why is this happening to me? Because you sat there and watched that same woman destroy families, destroy homes, and you didn't do nothing to prevent it. Now it's judgment time. Hey, Bishop, that's the captain that left, that, that left up out of here a couple months ago. That was his wife. Damn. You know what I mean? The captain that he gave, he just leave. You know, that was his wife. For years, his wife dis was destroying sisters in Saïe, was, 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 was um, destroying people in the congregation, and this man sit back and wasn't doing nothing. You understand? And we keep checking this captain. Yo, deal with your wife. Check your wife. And he never fix it. For nine years. What did he do eventually? He, he just up and leave. Turn his back on his brothers. I'm leaving our UIC. Oh, I'm still in the chute. No, this brother have been, have lost his wits for woman. You understand? That's what we just read. He have lost his wits. And guess what, brother? You are not getting the kingdom. You understand? Unless you repent. Yeah. Verse 28. And now do ye not believe me? Is not the king great in his power? Do not all regions fear to touch him? Yet did I see him... You know, we can stay on this stuff all day, but I'm trying to go somewhere, and it's not really the woman in the marriage. Go ahead. Verse 29. Yet did I see him in a pommy, the king's concubine, the daughter of the admirable Bardicus, sitting at the right hand of the king, and taking the crown from the king's head and setting it upon her own head. To total disrespect. She took the king's crown and put it on her own head. Go ahead. She also struck the king with her left hand. So a woman, see, a woman know when you whooped. A woman know when you weak as stuff. See, I could, I, could, I could put food on his head and eat and make the nigga not move. Don't move, nigga. And just eat a plate of food on your head. That's the expression they got in Haiti. That's some of y'all in here. Then when we bring it out to you, you mad at us. Because we see now. We see. Right, right. But you go home with that damn, damn demon. That's why I'm glad now we got the thing set up. When, regarding to raised up, how's his wife? What's going on with the wife? Go ahead. Verse 31. And yet for all this, the king gaped and gazed upon her with open mouth. Mm -hmm. If she laughed upon him, he laughed also. Yeah. He just wanted to please her to get in the panties. Go ahead. But if she took any displeasure at him, the king was fain to flatter. He saw flattering her right away. Go ahead. That she might be reconciled to him again. So that she'll calm down and just be in love with him again. Go ahead. O oh, ye men, how can it be but women should be strong, seeing they do thus? Then the king and the princes looked one upon another. So he began to speak of the truth. Yeah, they, they were shocked that the forefathers of Rupert had the nerve, had the audacity to disrespect the king. To his face. So I'm just going to tell you the truth. See, in this truth, that's how we got to be straight up. Right, well, he was telling the truth. It was factual, and they all saw it. Everybody, they, he said they all uh, looked in, at the king because they knew what he said was true. So the king couldn't say nothing about it. Damn. From there, from there. What verse did you just read? All, leave that was verse 33. Jump over to verse 42, please. Verse 42. Mm -hmm. Then said the king unto him, Ask what thou wilt more than is appointed in the writing. Because the Rubabel won the contest. Go ahead. And we will give it thee, because thou art found wisest, and thou shalt sit next me, and shalt be called my cousin. Then said he unto the king, Remember the vow, remember thy vow, which thou hast vowed to build Jerusalem in the day when thou camest to, the, to thy kingdom. I want to pause right there. Notice what he did. He didn't give a damn about the riches and the gold. The forefathers of Zerubbabel, he did not have, listen good, a covetous nature. Who did, he who did he think of first? Israel. He said, remember the vow you made. Remember that vow about rebuilding. And read it again. Verse 43. Then said he unto the king, remember thy vow, which thou hast vowed to build Jerusalem in the day when thou camest to thy kingdom. Read and to send away all the vessels that were taken away out of Jerusalem, which Cyrus set apart, 
when he vowed to destroy Babylon and to send them again thither. He says, and remember the stuff that uh, Babylon took out of the temple? I want you to bring all that stuff back to my motherland. Go ahead. Thou I want you to see his mindset. It wasn't about himself. He wasn't saying, I want gold, I want silver, I want gold, ne- I want necklaces, I want rings. Mm-mm. He said, I want to remember Israel. Rebuild the temple and put the things back in the temple. This is the mindset of our forefather. This is a leadership mentality. Go ahead. Thou also has vowed to build up the temple, which the Edomites burned when Judea was made desolate by the Chaldees. Yeah, because Esau is the one that burned down the temple. Go ahead. And now, O Lord the king, this is that which I require and which I desire of thee. And this is the princely liberality proceeding from thyself. I desire, therefore, that thou make good the vow, mm-hmm. the performance whereof, with thine own mouth, thou hast vowed to the king of heaven. So again, what I want you to see, he didn't think about it. So as a leader, we can't think of me, me, me first. That's why in the New Testament, if y'all know where it is, somebody get it for me. It said to think on the things of others. Who know what I'm talking about? Philippians chapter 2, verse 4. Look not every man on his own things. Look not every man on his own things. Go ahead. But every man also on the things of others. But every man also on the things of others. You got to see the good qualities in brothers and sisters around you. Don't always think about yourself. Especially if you are a camp leader, you're a man of rank. Try to look and see what qualities these brothers and sisters have. That's what Zerubbabel did. He had a kind of character. He thought about the rebuilding of Israel first. Opposed to riches and gold. Everybody understand that? Okay, from there, give me Zechariah chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. No, before that, before we get Zechariah, give me Sirach 10 and 9. When I made a statement, I said Zerubbabel was not covered. A covetous spirit is a terrible spirit for any leader to have. It's a destructive spirit. Sirach chapter 10, verse 9. Mm Mm-hmm. Why is earth and ashes proud? Why is man proud? Go ahead. There is not a more wicked thing than a covetous man. There's nothing worse than a covetous man. That's some heavy stuff right there. Go ahead. For such a one set of his own soul to sell. When you covetous, you will sell your own soul. Go ahead. Because while he liveth, he casteth away his bow. Right. You're giving your butt up for everything. I give you this for a dollar. Take it. Take it, man. Just take it. That's a, those of you in the entertainment business. You want to you break your way in. Yeah, you're going to sell your bowels, meaning you're going to grab your ankles. They're going to tell you to pull your ankles back behind your head. That's a bad visual anyway. This is what the hell is going on here. Now I'm about to vomit a little bit. Give me chapter 14 and verse 9. Sirach chapter 14 and verse <laughs> 9. A covetous man's eye is not satisfied with his portion. See that? We all got a proportion of something, but it says a covetous man is not satisfied with his portion. Go ahead. And the iniquity of the wicked dries up his soul. See that? And the iniquity of the wicked dries up his soul. Give me Zechariah 4 and 6. So that's the type of spirit we should definitely make sure we don't have. A covetous spirit. The book of Zechariah, chapter, chapter 4, verse 6. Mm-hmm. Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, this saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel. Go ahead. Saying, Not by might. Not by might. Nor by power. Nor by power. Go ahead. But by my spirit, saith the Lord of this hosts. This whole fight is spiritual. That's what God told Zerubbabel. That same message he told him goes for us today. Not by might, nor by power. But by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Go ahead. Verse 7. Who art thou, O great mountain? Referring to Persia. Go ahead. Before Zerubbabel, thou shalt become a plain. Before Zerubbabel, thou shalt become. Now, this is a twofold scripture, but I get into that another time. O great mountain. That great mountain is going into America also. It says, um, before Zerubbabel, thou shalt become a plain, meaning flat. Go ahead. And he shall bring forth the headstone. And he shall bring forth the headstone, meaning the chief cornerstone, that's Christ, go ahead. Thereof with shoutings, crying, grace, grace unto it. See that? So Zerubbabel was a, a great leader back then, and he would be so in the last days. And if you didn't know, Christ did come out of his loins. From there, give me First Maccabees 2. Talk about Greece for a moment. 
with the forefather, Judah Maccabee. So I'm explaining the four carpenters. I went from Daniel, Zerubbabel, now I'm dealing with Judah Mac Maccabee. There, go on. <laughs> the hell? <laughs> Judah Maccabees. Judas Maccabees in Greece. That's funny. <laughs> go ahead. Where we at? First Maccabees 266. Second, first Maccabee chapter 2, verse 66. As for Judas Maccabeus, he has been mighty and strong, even from his youth up. Let him be your captain. You know captain. what? He's been mighty. That's how Zerubbabel was. For him to be the king's bodyguard, now these attributes were reading the same quality Judah Maccabee had. Read it again. As for Judas Maccabeus, he has been mighty and strong, even from his youth up. Even from his youth up. Go ahead. Let him be your captain. And fight the battle of the people. And let him be your captain and fight the battle of the people. Give me chapter 3, verse 1. First Maccabee, chapter 3, verse 1. Then his son Judas, called Maccabeus, rose up in his stead. Because his dad, Matthias, Matthias had died. Go ahead. And all his brethren helped him. And all his brethren helped him. Go ahead. And so did all they that held with his father. So everyone honored their father of Judas Maccabee. They honored him. So when he said, make him be the captain, all the people abided by that. Go ahead. And they fought with cheerfulness the battle of Israel. And they fought with cheerfulness the battle of Israel. Believe it or not, brothers, today, guess what we're fighting? The battle of Israel. It's the same thing, but on a spiritual note. Go ahead. So he got his people great honor mm -hmm. and put on a breastplate as a giant and girt his warlike harness about him. And he made battles, protecting the host with his sword. Read. In his act, he was like a lion, and like a lion's whelp roaring for his prey. Mm. For he pursued the wicked and sought them out, and burnt up those that vexed his people. Wherefore the wicked shrunk for fear of him, and all the workers of iniquity were troubled, because salvation prospered in his hand. Y'all see that part? Because salvation prospered in his hand. It goes back to what we read in Nehemiah 9.27 about saviors. Salvation prospered in his hand. So this is the qualities or something we need to look at, examine. And when we send up our daily prayers, ask the Lord to make us that example like Christ, to make us that example like Judah Maccabee or Zerubbabel or Daniel. Many of us have favorites that when we read, and we want the Lord to make us like these forefathers that we read about. Give me chapter 4, verse 28. 1 Maccabee 4, verse 28. Eight. First Maccabee chapter 4, verse 28. Mm -hmm. The next year, therefore, following Lysias, gathered together three score thousand choice men of foot and five thousand horsemen that he might subdue them. So they came into Idumea and pitched their tents at Beth Sorah. And Judas met them with ten thousand men. And when he saw that mighty army, he prayed and said, Now notice what he's going against. Judas had what, ten thousand? He was going against sixty thousand men. 60,000 choice men of foot, meaning foot soldiers, and 5,000 horsemen. He came, Judas came with what? How many did he have? 10,000. 10, wow. Go ahead. And when he saw that mighty army, he prayed and said, Blessed art thou, O Savior of Israel. I want y'all to see his first action. action, thank you, was prayer. Not pull out the sword to fight, it was prayer first. That's why he told, the Lord said, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, say, we can overcome any battle in the spirit of the Lord. Y'all understand that? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Who disquell the violence of the mighty man by the hand of thy servant, David. Right. And gave us the host of strangers into the hands of Jonathan, the son of Saul, and his armor bearer. Shut up this army in the hand of thy people, Israel. And let them be confounded in their power and horsemen. So when we see opposition against this truth with the ADL, Anti-Defamation League, or the SPLC, Southern Poverty Law Center, we got to go to the Lord. We got to go to the Lord in prayer and ask the Lord to fight our battles. Go ahead. Make them to be of no courage mm -hmm. and cause the boldness of their strength to fall away and let them quake at their destruction. Well, they're going to be destroyed. Go ahead. Cast them down with the sword of them that love thee. And let all those that know thy name praise thee with thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. So they joined the battle. And there was slain of the host of Lysias about 5,000 men. Even before them were they slain. So the Lord 
blessed Judas Maccabee to fight and win the battle. Notice how he exhorted the men. That prayer alone was exhortation to get the men to do something they thought they could never do. He was what? A leader that was inspiring. And ins- a leader is an inspiration. Because we come up in a system where it, it seems weak. There are things we, th- we could never do it. But as we see, we are shocked at, from where we've been and, we've, and where we're at today. Right, like when we got that building in New York. And there's a lot of other things. People thought that we couldn't do it. Mm-hmm. They, they, they thought that we would make a mess and do what Negroes do. But we had a different spirit. We had the spirit of the Lord with us. Exactly. Okay, what verse? That was 36. Jump that, down that to was, verse. That was 34. Go down to verse 41. 41 to 46. For, verse 41. Then Judas appointed certain men to fight against those that were in the fortress until he had cleansed the sanctuary. So he chose priests of blameless conversation, such as had pleasure in the law. I want you to see his circle. Judah's circle was not, I'm going to say it again, was not a covetous circle of men. Notice, he chose priests of blameless conversation, such as had pleasure in the law. I mean, you could tell when these dudes talk about scripture, these dudes talk about Bible, they had a joy, a sincere joy in it. They wasn't... Here we go and talk about that Bible. Can we talk about NFL or NBA? No. We're going to talk about the law of God. So Judas would have been like that to roll with him. He said, those are the spirits I need around me. Go ahead. Verse 43. He cleansed the sanctuary and bear out the defiled stones into an unclean place. And when, they, when as they consulted what to do with the altar of burnt offerings, which was profane. Because remember the Greeks had sacrificed pigs, swine on the altar. Go ahead. They thought it best to pull it down. So they counseled and said, let's pull us down. Go ahead. Lest it should be a reproach to them, because the heathen had defiled it. Wherefore, they pulled it down and laid up the stones in the mountain of the temple in a convenient place until there should come a prophet to show what should be done with them. You know what I noticed about that verse 46 right there? They didn't know. Judas Maccabee and the issue was saying, I don't know. They didn't just fly off the top and make stuff up. It said, and laid up the stones in the mountain of the temple in a convenient place until there should come a prophet to show them what should be done with them. To show what should be done. Right. They had to put that faith in the Lord. There's some things we're not going to know. And we cannot be ashamed just to say, I don't know. Let's wait on the Lord. Let's wait on the Lord for that thing because I don't know. That's how we can get down. That's how we, when you're in your local schools and y'all counsel on things, if y'all counsel up and we don't know, just we don't know. In time, it ain't time yet, but it's going to come. Just be mindful of that. So from there, give me Isaiah 55, 4. We're going to Rome now. Rome. Rome. You go, what? R- Rome. Isaiah. What the hell? Yeah, Isaiah 55, 4. It's talking about Christ. The book of Isaiah chapter 55. In verse 4. Christ was born at the time of the Roman Empire. This is one of the four carpenters. Okay? Remember, in terms of the four uh, carpenters, remember what Paul said about himself? He said he was a wise, what? Master builder. So in Zechariah, where it talks about the four carpenters, these guys was organizers. They knew how to get things done. That's how all of us have to be in here. No man is an island. No man is an island. Read that. Isaiah chapter 55 and verse 4. Behold, I have given him for a witness to the people. Christ is a witness to the people. A leader. He's a leader. And commander. And Christ is commander. To the people. To the people. So Christ has, he got many titles. He's the all, he's like when he said he's the Alpha and Omega, he meant that thing. He's the commander. He's the leader. He's the great witness. Okay, was that it? Yes, sir. Give me chapter 42 and verse 21. Isaiah 42, 21. Book of Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 21. Still talking about Christ. The Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. See that? He will magnify the law and make it honorable. That's what Christ did. That's why when he said things in Matthew 5 about you have heard it been said of all time. Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, if you so much as look at a woman to lust after, you've already broken that law. So he took it to another level. 
And he, through that whole chapter, he was doing that. He said, I'm going to show you the depth to that scripture, what that verse is really meaning. So Christ magnified the law and made it honorable. Give me Luke 9 and 1. Luke 9 and 1. The book of Luke, chapter 9 and verse 1. Then he called his 12 disciples together and gave them power and authority over all devils mm. and to cure diseases. And he sent them to preach the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he said unto them, take nothing for your journey, neither staves, nor scrip, neither bread, neither money, neither have two coats apiece. And whatsoever house ye enter into, there abide. And thence depart. And whosoever will not receive you, when you go out of that city, shake off the very dust from your feet for a testimony against them. And they departed and went through the towns, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. So Christ had 12 disciples. The word disciple means student or learning ones. So he had 12 and he sent them out. He gave them power and authority. To cat to over, over all devils and to cure diseases. So Judas Mac, Judas Iscariot, excuse me, had spiritual power. And that's what Christ said, not to rejoice over that. He said, you better rejoice because the kingdom of heaven is here. But they were rejoicing because they had power. Sometimes we look at the wrong things. Judas Mac, Judas, excuse me, I keep saying it. Judas Iscariot had spiritual power and lost the kingdom of heaven. Christ said it would have been better if that man was never born. Now, how many of you want to be that guy? Why? Judas Iscariot was what quality did he have? Covetous. He was covetous. Money, money, money. He betrayed the Son of God for what? 30 pieces of silver. Covetousness is a terrible quality for any leader to have. It's a destructive spirit. Okay? From there, give me uh, Luke 10 and 1. Yes. Some brothers today... Be trade for less than that. Mm -hmm. Yes, I said it. Some brothers today, Judas Carrier be trade Christ for totally peace. Some brothers today be trade his own brothers for less than that. Today they're gone. You're right about that. Right about that. Look, watch this in Luke 10. Luke chapter 10, verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also. So this is after the 12. He appointed other 70 disciples also. Go ahead. And sent them two and two before his face into every city and place, whither he himself would come. Now that's another level right there. Notice he sent them out by twos. We're going to come to that point, brothers. Right now, what y'all don't see, you got to look at it spiritual. Right now, we have camp set up, right? And we have a joke amongst various brothers, some of y'all. He said, well, you got camp muscles. You speak and say things that if it was just you and one brother, you would never say that to that brother or sister. Because you know you might get the beat down out there. You understand what I'm saying? Call camp muscles. But if it's just two of you, you're going to use wisdom. You're going to use more wisdom. I remember I give an example. There's a captain here. When he over there. I ain't going to say who he is, but he's here. <laughs> he's, in, he's teaching with him and another brother. He was out by twos. And it was a football team. Everybody on the fo football team was no less than 250 pounds. That was the skinny brother. And the brothers was talking big talk against sports. So the, all the brothers on the football team took their helmets off and said, what you say, little nigga? He said, <laughs> Nothing. Give me a hug. Bring it in. Bring it in. Bring it in. I'm just messing with you. <laughs> that was wisdom. <laughs> just trying to edify the people, brothers. He took the bass out of his voice. He started talking like this. Hey. Well, yes. Yeah, Bishop, what's heavy with what, how Christ and all the disciples in tools? That's so heavy right there because imagine if we start doing that. If you brothers built yourself up where you could teach for two hours, three, four hours. You know what I mean? When they shut us down off of YouTube, guess what? Brothers, listen, we got to be able to cover more grounds. You know what I mean? We got, we got 200 men in the camp. Guess what? The city, every corner you go in the city, you must, be, you must see brothers teaching. You understand? So they ain't going to stop us, man, even though they shut us down from on social media. All past laws saying, oh, it's too many of you loitering. They could do that. They can say, oh, this is, you're breaking the loitering law. Because, what is loitering? It's three or more. It says, too many of y'all, 
you're breaking the, uh, the, uh, the statute out here. So then I was, okay, we're going to do toots and cover more ground. See, this whole thing is spiritual. We're going to roll with the punches no matter what happens. You may understand that thing? So don't be scared. So if, you, if you're teaching up to par, just study more. Study more and use wisdom because hey, you know Bishop. you ain't going to be talking big talk like that no more. Hey, yes. Bishop, actually a lot of our camp are already go out in twos. Oh, yeah? That's oh, a lot of the camps down south because, like, the, you know, the congregations have grown so big. So what, like, um, I know a lot of camps in the south, what they do, we'll set up like a six-man camp. Everybody go out in twos on fly missions. So we already going out in twos. All praises, yes, all sir. praises. That's some good stuff right there. See, I didn't want to drop it on you because I know some of you still kind of scared and afraid. I don't know what we can do. Send us by twos, though. Everybody want to beat us up. Don't be scared about that. Now, from there, from there, where was we at? Where's in Luke 10? Where were we at? That was Luke 10. Luke 10 and 1. Verse 2. Therefore said he unto them, The harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest, that he would send forth laborers into his harvest. That's why Deacon Malachi was saying, like I always often say, don't be satisfied with this. This is nothing. Christ said, pray for laborers. Meaning what? Men that's going to put their work in and not make excuses. Because let's say you get 10 brothers in. They come in. Out of that 10, you might only have three decent brothers that's diligent about the work. The other seven, mm, they're just there taking up space. They want to counsel every week. No. See, them, those, that's, you gotta, we got to keep praying for laborers. Never stop praying for laborers. Because this is about nation building, nation growth, nation time. Like my shy used to always say, this is nation time. Okay, so always say that thing to inspire us. This is nothing. 500, 1,000, 2,000, 4,000, 6,000, 10,000. That's nothing. The Bible says Israel numbers what? The sand of the sea. And I'm not making reference to Hosea 1 and 10. I'm making reference to Revelation 7 and 9. That great exceeding multitude. That's why we can never get complacent or satisfied with whatever number we got. We got to always be about growing. Read. Verse 3. Go your ways. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Mm -hmm. Carry neither purse, nor scrip, nor shoes. And salute no man by the way. Talking about extra. Somebody said, well, not, they didn't wear shoes. Yeah, they wore shoes. Somebody extra pair of shoes. Go ahead. And into whatsoever house ye enter, first say, peace be to this house. Mm -hmm. And if the son of peace be there, your peace shall rest upon it. If not, it shall turn to you again. Because at this time, people would take care of the disciples. They had, our people had that, that, uh, that sense of uh, hospitality. That's the word. Thank you. Verse 7. And in the same house remain eating and drinking such things as they give. For the laborer is worthy of his hire. Go not from house to house. Right, go ahead. And into whatsoever city ye enter, and they receive you, eat such things as are set before you. Read. And heal the sick that are therein. And say unto them, the kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. The kingdom of God has come nigh unto you. Why? Because they understood the spirit of brotherhood. They understood love thy neighbor. They understood that thing. Okay? From there. Give me chapter 10. I mean, we just read it. Acts 4.13. I'm sorry. Acts 4.13. I want to show you something about the disciples. And I've said it a few times before, but I know some of you are new. The book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 13. Pay close attention. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled and they took knowledge of them. That they had been with Jesus. So they knew, just based on the way they taught the scriptures, mm -hmm. they were followers of Christ. Why? They patterned themselves after Christ. That's what they did. And you might, Now, we all would love to do that. I would love to be able to, for all of us to be able to do that. We can only go by what we're reading. But other than that, we have to go by what? Remember, like it says in Acts 8, how can I accept some man should guide me? So when we came in, we was in our 20s. We watched the elders, how, cause especially the Haitian brothers, they needed it. Uh, they didn't know how to dress for nothing. So they had to watch the leadership, how they, because, you know, Levi came in with high water pants, white tube socks, and black church shoes. So what the hell is this? That ain't how you dress, boy. Now, now, now you get us confused with Benji. Oh, that's Benji? I'm sorry. 
So we, had, we patterned ourselves after our elders. That's what we did. We, and we patterned ourselves in terms of teaching after our elders. That's what we did. That's the, and you know, people try to make you feel ashamed. Man, you sound just like so-and-so. There's nothing wrong with that. That's right. It's an honor when they can say you're like, you sound like your teacher. Right. I mean, yeah, I have succeeded. That's a good thing. But the whole, they want to stir the Negro spirit of evil in you. Go, no, 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 I shouldn't sound. I should I'll be your own man. You ever hear people say, oh, we don't want to hear the Bible. What do you have to say? So they can argue with you. But it's the same mentality. Don't pattern yourself after your father, whether your earthly father or your spiritual father. That's that dumb mentality. You're supposed to pattern yourself after A, your physical father or your spiritual father's. That's, that's how they fragment you from your forefathers by doing that. That's what they try to get us to do, try to break you away from your, from your lineage. But they don't do that themselves. I'm talking about the nations. They honored their fathers. They honored all, all the way back, like I, like I said before, in, in a car company. They got these new cars that got all kinds of stuff on it that can do this, that can do that. But go to the actual factory where the car was made and you go look down in the, down in the area where the first car was built. They keep that acknowledgement of their very first car that they made. They have that behind the velvet ropes, so to speak. Like, this is where we got our ingenuity and all that from. So that's how we mimic our fathers, the same way we honor those that came before us. People want you to cut that off. No, we're not cutting that off. The hell with you. Exactly. We're going to do... Exactly Don't in the White House, they have pictures of yeah, all the exactly. previous presidents. All over the place. They, they always honor. have that. In different the, companies, they have that. Exactly. The man that started the, started the business off, they got it on a frame with lights on it and all that. He don't know half the stuff that, they, that the people in the company know now. But they honor their very first one. He was the first president this. He was the first one that did this, the first CEO. They keep that stuff. But it's our stupid behinds that allow people to tell us, no, we can't mimic and, and look up to our fathers. You're a bunch of idiots for following that stupidity. <laughs> exactly. The hell with them. So now when we discuss the uh, four carpenters, according to Ze Zechariah 1. Now I want to talk about the five levels of discipleship. The five levels of discipleship. And these are things that's going on within IUIC. These dealing with the ranking structures within IUIC. I'm not talking about no other, other camp because I don't know what's going on there. Um, how good people always want us to... Uh, Come together with all the other camps. That will happen when the Lord returns. Uh, give me real quick before we get into that. Uh, Second Chronicles three and six, please. Second Chronicles three and Second Corinthians. I'm sorry, I said Chronicles. Second Corinthians chapter three verse six, because there's a doctrine going around now that we are not under the New Testament, but we're still under the Old Testament. No, we don't agree with that. Read that. Second Corinthians chapter three, verse six, who also have made us able ministers of the New Testament. If we are able ministers of the New Testament, how are we not under? I don't understand the, 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 the mindset of Negroes. How are we not under the New Testament or New Covenant? And the Bible says he has made us able ministers of the New Testament. Read it again. Who also have made us able ministers of the New Testament. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. When it says not of the letter, meaning not of the old covenant, but of the Spirit, meaning of Christ. Go ahead. Was For, that it? No, sir. For the letter killeth. For the letter, meaning the old covenant killeth. Because we cannot get, get perfection or salvation through animal sacrifice. Go ahead. But the Spirit giveth life. But Christ giveth life. Everybody understand that? Matthew, Matthew 26, 26. Chapter 26, verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. This is my blood of the New Testament. So how are we not, I don't understand this, y'all, stop. How are people saying we're not under the New Testament or New Covenant? It's the same thing. That veil is, like it says, was that 2 Corinthians 3? That veil is over their eyes to this very day. 
Wow, you can't make this stuff up. After reading that understanding, you should just immediately repent of that evil because it's in clear black and white hitting you upside the head English. So, again, we love our brothers, we love our sisters, but this is why we often cannot come together as one because of the difference in doctrine and understanding of Scripture. Everybody understand that? It's not that we have personal gripes with them. That has nothing to do with it at all. It deals with doctrine. All right? So now I want to talk about the five levels of discipleship in brief. I want to talk about the first level, the soldier level. How many of you soldiers in here? Raise your hand. Soldiers. All right, these are soldiers. Okay, all right. I mean, well, technically we're all soldiers for the Lord, but I'm talking about in terms of rank, okay? The soldier, the soldier, soldier level of discipleship is oftentimes called the positional level. Or, I, or like I like to say, you're at the just because level. You're a soldier because you took a test. And people only follow you as a soldier because leadership tells them to follow you. How many soldiers in here are over a school? Stand up so I can see. I want to see. I want to see. Oh, that's the Portland brother. Oh, that's Samson, right? So Samson is a soldier, but he's over a school. Okay. All right. So again, when you're at that soldier level, people follow you only because it's not because you've done great works. It has nothing to do with that. They are following you. I want you to understand. They're following you just because, A, you took a test. B, leadership says follow him. He's the point man. He's the top guy. So the people will, who love this truth will abide with that. Everybody understand that so far? So most, most, all of us start at this position, but don't stay there. Give me that Titus 2 Corinthians, not Titus, give me 2 Corinthians 8.23. 2 Corinthians 8.23. The book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 8 and verse 23. Whether any do inquire of Titus... He is my partner and fellow. Because people were questioning Titus. Who is this guy? We don't know this guy. That's the question they had with Paul. Read it again. Whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you. So Paul had to speak up for him. Just like you soldiers, we have to speak up for you. You're over a school, we got to say, hey, follow his lead. This is the man right now that's over the school. Read it again. Whether any do inquire of Titus, he is my partner and fellow helper concerning you, or our brethren be inquired of. Because they was questioning everybody that Paul sent. Go ahead. They are the messengers of the churches and the glory of Christ. So Paul had to explain that these men are set up. Listen to them. Because why? Paul was often either traveling or he was in prison, one or the other. And he had to give instructions. These are the men to follow. So when you're at that level, when you just come in, that's that positional level. That's, like I say, the just because level of a, sol a soldier. You took a test, and we're saying, hey, follow this brother here. The second level of discipleship, which is the officers, and I'm starting from officers of 10 on up, that's what's called the acceptance discipleship. Meaning what? You, take a, you, you too, you take a test. But the thing that you've done that's different than many other soldiers may be that as an officer, you've gotten the love of the congregation. Okay, meaning people say, you know what? He's doing a little bit here and there. We like him. Okay, give me that in Sirach 4 and 7. The book of Sirach, chapter 4 and verse 7. Get thyself the love of the congregation. Get thyself the love of the congregation. We often tell you men to do that thing. You must get the love of the congregation. So when you come in as a soldier many times, as a soldier, you don't have that yet. It's not until you start moving up in ranks when you get to the officer level where you start to get the love of the con congregation. Okay? Read that again. Verse 7. Get thyself the love of the congregation. And bow thy head to a great man. So people observe you. They say, you know what? We're starting to take a liking to this guy. He's, he's scriptural and he respects leadership. Okay, why? Because we were the ones that said, give this guy the test. 
have him move up in the ranks, and he's been doing due diligence to gain the love and respect of the congregation. So that's that second level, okay, of which is an acceptance level of discipleship. Philippians chapter 2, verse 25. What the hell's wrong with me? Go ahead. Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because that ye had heard that he had been sick. <clears throat> For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him and not on him only, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I send him therefore the more carefully that when ye see him again, ye may rejoice, and that I may be the less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness and hold such in reputation. Because for the work of Christ, he was nigh unto death. So people loved Epaphroditus. Why? Because he sat like uh, Deacon Malachi was going over sacrificing. He was a living sacrifice, literally, okay? Sacrificing himself near the point of death. And when people see that and know that, they, they will fall in love, spiritually fall in love with a spirit like that. Because they know you're going to go all out for them. Do you understand what I'm saying? Okay, from there. Give me, I want Acts. Acts 15. I'm going to the third level of discipleship, which is the captain's level. The captain's level. Captains, captains. The, ca the captains are at the production level of discipleship. Meaning they have more, not only have they taken the test, not only have they um, gotten to love the congregation, but they are producing now. They are, they are producing great things in Israel. Now, if you are a captain and you're not, because believe it or not, mm, how can I say this? Mm, how can I say this nicely? All, every captain we have is not yet at the captain level. And what I mean by that is this. We have seen potential in some of you captains that you may not see in yourselves. So we decided to put you at such a seat, okay, so that you can grow into that. Because there's a need for you, a need for a captain in your area, your local area, your region, okay? So again, the captain level is the production level of discipleship. People follow because of the work you do and for the love of the congregation. And you know, there's some, many times we'll read about people that we give little credit to, like Silas. Silas, give me that in Acts 15.30. I hope I got that one right. Let me the look. book of Acts, chapter 15, verse 30. Verse 30. So when they were dismissed, they came to Antioch. And when they had gathered the multitude together... They delivered the epistle, read. which when they had read, they rejoiced for the consolation. And Judas and Silas, being prophets also themselves, exhorted the brethren with many words mm -hmm. and confirmed them. Read. And after they had tarried there a space, they were let go in peace from the brethren unto the apostles. Notwithstanding, it pleased Silas to abide there still. See what Silas did? He said, you know what? I think it's better for me to stay behind and continue building the brothers and sisters here. That's a captain right there. That's captain mentality. He said, I'm going to stay behind and continue this work. Continue what? Helping to build the men and women in this region, in this area. And that's what the Lord is looking for. Okay? That's what we're looking for. Spirits like that. Okay? And we know it's not something you can just do overnight. You got to pray about it, number one, of course. Get your situation correct and fixed, and then we can make such moves such as that. The fourth level, which is like the deacon's level, which is the development stage of discipleship. People follow because of the works they do, the wisdom they have, and the changes they make in people's lives. Leaders develop leaders, and that's that deacon stage, where they can look on the things of others 
and show change and growth in men and women like that. Let me give you an example. Like, go to Acts chapter 6, verse 3. Stephen. Stephen was a, a deacon. The book of Acts, chapter 6 and verse 2. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. So Stephen was one of them when you read down. Read the next verse. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer. And to the ministry of the word. Read. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost. And Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. Go ahead. Whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. These seven men. And I'm pointing out Stephen because he went through a great turmoil as a deacon. They were at that developmental stage where they were able to do great works and more importantly, develop people. Leaders develop leaders. If you come into this truth, and I'll give you an example. There's a young man, I ain't going to point him out. He's an officer. And we, he came up to the table one day, and he's a senior man. And I asked his number two a question in the congregation. And his number two didn't know. So I asked his number three. His number three didn't know. So they're both number two and number three. said, so let me, let's go ask uh, the senior man. So they go to the senior man. Senior man comes over and gives the answer. I, saw, I said, all right. So I asked another question to number two and number three. Number two and number three didn't know again. So I go to the main guy. I said, so what's the answer to this? What's going on here? He gave the answer. So I said, uh, how come number two and number three don't know too much? He was like, well, uh, 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 so number two and number three said, well, our number one, he, number one, he doesn't bring us in on the councils. He doesn't let us sit there and observe how to counsel people, the ins and outs or, or, or doings in the council, the type of questions to ask or not to ask. He doesn't involve us in things. That's, let me tell you, men, something. That's terrible leadership. Terrible. That, like that old expression, each one teach one. No man is an island. So if number one falls, the whole school falls apart because nobody knows what the hell to do. Terrible leadership. Terrible. Some brothers are in positions out of, uh, let me get a nice way to say this. Not that default. We, where we've seen, uh, like in North Carolina, where you had a top man purposely keeping men down in rank. And we raised these certain brothers up. And it's not that they were uh, very scriptural men, but I told what I told you. Yeah, no one can hear you. It's my job to teach them. Exactly. You got to raise these men up. Raise them up. Because bring we saw up. the problem there. So there's a problem going on there. And, and it's that old nigger spirit. I don't want nobody in my realm. I'm going to keep everybody down there. So you always have to depend on moi. Yeah, job security. Exactly. Like we were discussing at the beginning. That's a Negro spirit. Bring them in on the councils and things like that so that they can learn how to counsel just in case you have to do something bigger. Exactly. And that is the goal. The goal is for the senior men over a camp to eventually, as he gets raised up, to start traveling to the next cities, to that city, to that state, or that country, and let number two handle it. And then as he comes up, then number three takes that seat. And number two is now going to that city and that state and that country. Do y'all see that? Y'all understand? That's the goal. That's the agenda. But then you get the brother, oh, I want to travel with you guys. Well, what have you done in your local area? Nothing. Then why do you want to travel with us? You have to build up your name or build up your works in your local area first. Do you understand that? Sure. Understand that thing right there. Because I'll ask the deacons or whoever's or the captains, do y'all know this dude? No. So how the hell do you want to come with us then? 
We don't know. You got you to gotta build, get your rep up. Can I say that? Get your rep up. Who are you? Does your local area know you? When your name comes up, is it always in something negative? We're going to say y'all saw? When you come back, because you built the men up, you don't want to come back and your camp is all messed up because you physically wasn't there. You want to, make, you want to be able to bring the men up to a level where you can move somewhere else and handle business and come back and your camp is in order because the men that's left there, they have a certain amount of knowledge on how to run the camp in your absence. Exactly. And again, I, I definitely want to say this, that uh, there's always exceptions to these five levels I'm going over because, for example, officers, when we move you up to like 60, 70, 80, or 90, we see the potential of captain right there. But there's a few things you need to work on. That's why we do that thing right there. All right? And as an officer, you should already be doing captain work and guess what captains should be doing deacon work and deacons should be doing bishop work that's how it goes that's how it works that's how we're trying to gain gauge the mindset of you brothers okay be one step above one step above do that work okay uh the next yeah, level yeah, yeah. then bishop you remember we went to one of the camp there was a, at least 30 men you remember because what the leaders has done, they keep these men down. Yes. For the, these men to not to question them. Mm -hmm. A lot of brothers do that. You see, if, if, like, I don't know if I said it earlier, but if you've been in this truth eight years and you're still a soldier, something's wrong. It might be you, but it might be the men over you. You got, always got to look at them possibilities. Find out who's been in that rank for all those years and why. Is it that he's a do-nothing, a bum? Or is the man over him purposely holding him down? You understand what I said, Hananiah, Captain Hananiah? Yes, sir. Y'all got to be, you captains be mindful of that. Don't think everybody that wear fringes and a board of blue is right. Some people are Negroes to, through and through. I don't want nobody to get, uh -uh, you can't get above me. Uh -uh. You got to mind that thing. You know what? When you think about history like David and Saul. Now, Saul was the king. God sent David to Saul to help Saul. Saul could have used that and sort of good in that. But he got, instead he got jealous because said Dave, the women sang that song. Saul kills his thousands, but David is ten thousands. David was not looking to overthrow Saul. That was not in his mind. He wanted to help Saul. And you got men like that in your camp. Think about your camps, where you're at. God will send men in your camp to assist and help you. But because you are Negro, you see it like a, you got a soul spirit and go, no, I want to hold this dude back. Mm -mm, mm -mm. I remember there was one school we went to. They ain't sitting over here, dude. I ain't going to call them out. But they got a new school. And this one brother, let's say I'll just say you, for example, was getting all the credit. He's, oh, he did this, he did that. So I'm sitting there, and I said, I didn't know you had that, that skill, bro. So I said, did he really get to school? And they said, no, it was brother so-and-so over there. So I said, wait a minute, so why did you give him credit? Oh, because he don't have rank. I said, what the hell is this? Brother so-and-so got to school. This, I knew this dude had no skill set in that field. So it was strange to me. I said, that's Negro of y'all, to d discredit this brother and give this dude all the credit, and he ain't do S.H., that's some evil stuff right there. And we've seen it in the body. Yep, Bishop. Yes. There is a brother right now. If you go to that state page, IURC, IURC that state, every single video, his face is in the front. But he's not the only one go to camp. His face is on every single video. That's a problem right there. That right there tell me a lot about the brother right there. You got... Three, four camp in that state. But every video, every, every camp video you face is in it? Come on, bro. Something got to tell you something wrong. With, right there, something wrong. And we want y'all to know we see you. We see you with binoculars. <laughs> don't think we, just because we smile at you. Hey, shalom, bro. Don't mean that we don't see you. And it, now, is it, let me ask y'all this. Is it that the men under him are just, 
scripturally weak and just don't know how to break down scriptures? That's, I said like that, Bishop. Let's say the man under him was weak. His face is in every single video. That makes absolutely no sense. That makes absolutely no sense. The other man is, you're not the one who put in work in the camp. The other man put in work too. Mm -hmm. The other man go to camp with you. So the other man never, never you don't want to teach, the other man never teach? Come on, bro. That's a problem right there. That's telling me, your mindset, me, 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 me. That's a selfish mindset. You're not, listen, you're not a great leader at all. You're not. As a matter of fact, you should, so you should take the credit from you, give it to the man that's with you. That's what a great leader does. A great leader don't boost himself up. A great leader boosts the men under him. Mm -hmm. That's what makes you a great leader. The mark of a great leader is measured by the students who he leads. That's right. That's how you can tell what a good leader is. When you see the men that he's in, that with the men that he's over, and you see them come up, then you can say, okay, I know that this is because this man is doing the right thing with these people. But if you never see any progress coming from the men he's leading, then he's not leading them. That's not the mark of a good leader. That's a vainglorious spirit. The most I don't like that kind of spirit. We're over God's heritage, and our job is to raise these men up. Yeah, one, one, you remember in one camp we went, when the brother said to me, he said to me, I said, why you don't raise the young men up? He said, because he's not worthy. That's what he told me. Why is he not worthy? Yeah. Why is he no, not he's, worthy? He's why not he worthy. Not? Why? Because, uh, yeah, because the young man came. He said, oh, that's my man right here. He do everything, deacon. Then I said, oh, so why he's still a soldier? He said, oh, because he's not worthy. I say, you was not worthy when they give you the wink. They, they see the potential in you. You understand? You got to see the same potential in these young men. Exactly. You know, I, I was listening to Deacon Aitan's class, the, was it yesterday? Yeah. Where you were discussing uh, the sons of the prophets and how those were actual schools. So what we're doing today is nothing different than our forefathers did. The sons of the prophets just refers to those disciples that were learning to become prophets. Okay, it had nothing to do with their uh, bloodline. I mean, as Israel they were, but not like, the, like it wasn't there was Jeremiah's son or uh, Ezekiel's son. It wasn't that. And you had many schools. Okay. And Elisha, who was given to Elijah to... Uh, work with him, Elijah didn't have an envious spirit over Elisha at all. And that's why I brought up earlier about David and Saul. Or even Moses and Joshua. You got to think about it. Think about them. Think about the men that God brought in your camp, in your school, in your respective school. Are you going to deal with them the way Saul dealt with David? Or the way Moses dealt with Joshua? Or Elijah dealt with Elisha? You got to see the good in these brothers that's coming in. They ain't there for no good. Exactly. Let them grow. And believe it or not, some, believe it or not, I know it's going to upset some people now. Some people are over you. Some people may come in today and be over you in the time to come. It is what it is. You can't change. There's nothing we can do about it. Because imagine the Lord come back and starts, he'll change everything that's set up. And guess what? We have nothing to say. It's, it's going to be Khan Adawan Khan. <laughs> All praises to the yep. most high. That's how it's going to be. So the apex, or the next level, the fifth level, like the bishop level, um, people follow because of longevity and time. I heard a brother, not here in IUIC, he t five years in the truth and he is a bishop. I'm like, wow, you can't make this stuff up. That's similar to, you, 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 it's five of you in a camp and you're a captain of 5,000. But there's only five of you in the whole school. That's the same thing. I'm a bishop, but I've been in the truth five years. Makes no sense. So at the bishop level, and the deacons operate on a bishop level. So don't think, I don't see, I see. People follow because of your longevity, your time, wisdom, and reputation. The book of Galatians, chapter 2, verse 1. Then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation and communicated unto them the go that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run 
or had run in vain. You know what's funny about that verse? Who taught Paul? Huh? No. Gamaliel didn't teach Paul about Christ. That's, I should have made my question clearer. Who taught Paul about Christ? Yes. <laughs> get that, get, look at this. Go to chapter 1 and verse 12. Galatians chapter 1 verse 12. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. That goes back to Acts 9, 15, Acts 9, 8 through 20, where Christ knocked Paul off the horse. He instructed him. So my point is, when you look at Galatians 2 now, and look at verse 2 again. I'm going to show you something odd. Galatians chapter 2, verse 2. And I went up by revelation and communicated unto them that gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. Those are the scattered Israelite foreigners, go ahead. But privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. So Paul went to them which were of reputation. Number one, he understood that Peter, James, and John, or the, the 12, had a reputation he himself did not have. They had longevity in the truth he himself did not have. They walked with the Son of God. Okay? So he said, I'm going to those of reputation. They had a reputation of being in this truth, of doing the works. But what's odd about it, he said, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. I'm asking again, who taught Paul? Christ taught him. So for him to go to those of reputation, uh, lest he should run or had run in vain, he's showing what? Respect. Because Christ already told him, those Israelites over there teach them. He didn't have to ask Peter and them nothing, but he just, out of respect, and the people that was around him, because the people was not accepting what Paul said. He said, let's go to those of reputation and let them make, be the deciding factor. So those of reputation, that's when you get to that top level. Yawasap has uh, reputation as well as longevity. When you came in? 90, 91. Kenai came in 95, I believe, 95. That's longevity. That's time right there. Where well, have you been in the true five years, you don't have that yet. So don't try to put yourself there. You're not there. I heard a brother say, uh, young brother, my el I remember, I saw a video with, with our elder, Arya. I said, you never met Arya. What are you talking about? Shut up. Elder Masha, you never met Masha. Be quiet. Your elders are here. These are your elders. Ooh, 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 ooh. You know, black people. Ooh, 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 ooh. Reputation. So that's when you get to that next level. And I, and I see that in the deacons. And it's going to be a lot of shifting, God willing, that God allows. When I thought I was on my damn deathbed, I gave y'all something to run now. I said, this is how it's going to go. Did I not? I know he was nervous and scared as hell. I said, this was going to go down. <laughs> go ahead, what are you going to say? Just got to put on the boots. <laughs> Just got to put on the boots. <laughs> are you sure? I said, yes, I'm sure. This is what's going to happen. So, Lord brought me out of that thing right there. All praise to the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. But I labored more abundantly than they all. One thing about Paul, he labored more abundantly than everybody. He put works in. And guess what? Paul was not crying about rank. And understand, he wasn't belly aching about rank. He was about God's work. Give me chapter 3 and verse 10. 1 Corinthians 3. 1 Corinthians. Verse, hopefully that's right. Chapter 3, verse 10. Yeah, that's it. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder. See that? Wise master builder goes back to Zechariah 1 about the four carpenters. Those four carpenters, which was Daniel, who else was it? Uh, Zerubbabel, Judah Maccabee, and Christ. Those four carpenters, it's about building a house, organization of the people. We all got to come to inspiring the people do, to do things they had no thought that they could possibly ever do. So now, 
Let me talk about good leadership and bad leadership. Good leadership is proactive. Write that down. Good leadership is proactive. You see things, you, you, you uh, see things before it comes to pass, and you prepare for what may come. Everybody understand that? Good leadership focuses on improving yourself first. Then you can better improve. Hey, give me that scripture. It just popped in my mind. Mm, actually, give me Romans 12 and 2. Romans 12 and 2. The book of Romans, chapter 12 and verse 2. Mm -hmm. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You see that? So we got to be transformed, renewing in our mind, that we can prove the only way you can prove what is good and acceptable is if you are a living sacrifice. You are a walking example. People have witnessed the change in you. Now give me the one that says uh, in Corinthians, it says uh, being ready to avenge all disobedience when you're... Yeah, I got it. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 6. Yes. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 6. Watch this. And having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience. Because we all want to go out and teach and organize the people. We want to tear them up and get on them. It says, and having in a readiness to revenge all disobedience. Watch. When your obedience is fulfilled. When your obedience is fulfilled. How am I going to go out there and correct you about the Sabbath day? And I'm breaking the Sabbath. Wow. Wow. How am I going to tell you that thou shalt not commit adultery and I'm committing adultery? Wow. He's saying, check you first. So good leadership, good leadership is about self-improvement, improving your, write this down, your attitude, your education in the scriptures, your enthusiasm in the scriptures, and your skill set. That's what good leadership does. Always about, how can I improve myself in this area? And you take responsibility. What, whatever goes down, a good leader says, I'm going to take responsibility for that. Because it's my fault. You know that expression, SH runs downhill. That's what happened. Because guess what? When y'all do something wrong, guess who's going to take the blame for it? It's going to come up this way. The leadership at RUIC, did it. When I, remember the dude shot the guy? They didn't blame y'all. They said, the, uh, the leadership here. That's what they do. All right, I'm going to eat that. I'm going to eat that. Although I know I'm going to eat it right now. Right, he wasn't even with us. Bad leadership now, bad leadership is reactive. Bad leadership only responds to things that occur at the time. That means you didn't look ahead of time of what the possibilities, what could happen. Like I give an example here. Remember you had the food thing, Malachi? And that was a good thing. And then you had a certain captain screw it up for a little bit. <clears throat> in Miami, I ain't gonna point. I ain't gonna point, but he's sitting right over there. We said this is something that could help benefit Israel as a whole. Then he put a certain brother over it that was lazy, that was shiftless, and the farm said, "You know what? You're not. Uh, you're not ready for this. We're not going to give you any more food. We're not giving you anything. Goodbye." So we want to thank our good captain. <laughs> you, know, you know when somebody guilty, they say, I'm not even going to look up. I'm just going to keep my head down right here. It's all right, though. It's all right. We love the captain. Bad leadership takes no responsibility. None whatsoever. You ever meet brothers like that when you point something out? No, no, it's this one. It's that one over there. It's over there. Oh, you ever meet women like that? Let me tell you what women do. Your wife will do something messed up. And you'll check on it. And she'll say, what about what you did? But what, that, that has nothing to do with what happened just now. You just did. And she'll go, but, but remember last month you did something? That's some deflection. Some brothers do that got that same spirit on them. Uh, leadership is like any other skill or learning. It must be practiced until it becomes a part of you. Write this down. Consistency and discipline work together. I remember, oh, Brother Yavin from Cali said that. I like that thing. Consistency and discipline work together.
You might know, and I'll, and, and I'll say this. Brothers often ask, how, can, how do I always stay motivated? Easy. I'm not always motivated, but I'm always disciplined. I gave, I forgot what brother I was talking with. I gave him an example about a job. You, you get a job, right, in the work world I'm talking about, and you're excited, you're motivated, okay? You got, you're, you're enthusiastic about the job. But what happens six months to a year of being on that job? You lose that motivation, that inspiration that you had for the job. It's like, oh, um, now you start showing up late at times. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you try to maintain discipline to always be there. Or work, what are you going to say? Right, or consistency. Or let's say you go to the gym. You know, when you, I'm going to I'm gonna use, lose weight. I'm going to get some muscles. I'm going to fix my body. And the first, let's, first few weeks to a month, you're energetic. You're enthusiastic. But after that month or two months goes by, it's like, eh, mm, no, I really don't know if this is what I want to do. I don't feel like getting up six in the morning, jogging and doing all that stuff. But you try to maintain a level of discipline to keep a little something going. So I said all that to say that's how the truth is. You're in this truth. When you first come in, you're on fire for the Lord. And after a while, you start to notice that you don't have that same fire no more. But that's okay because it comes and goes. But you must always maintain discipline or consistency in this truth. Everybody understand what I'm saying? Another thing, before you become a good leader, you must first become a good student and develop yourself. Good leadership is inspiration, not domination. Write that down. Ins do <laughs> good leadership, a good leader, is not domination. Good leadership is inspiration, not domination. Good leadership is cooperation, not intimidation. Remember that dude in Texas? That little f f dude we had in Texas over the school? He used to, what was his name? Yeah, Harvey Dent. Harvey Dent. He used to intimidate the whole congregation. You know what I'm talking about, right, Jadon? He intimidated you. He used to bully you all up in the camp. <laughs> but that's, not, that's bad leadership. Bad leadership. When you rule by domination and intimidation. Hey, find me that scripture that says uh, about roughness and pride. The book of Sirach, chapter 10 and verse 21. The fear of the Lord goeth before the obtaining of authority, but roughness and pride is the losing thereof. You see that? You see, read it again. The fear of the Lord goeth before the obtaining of authority. So that's what we look for. Before we give you authority, we try our best to look for that spirit on you. Read it again. The fear of the Lord goeth before the obtaining of authority. We check to see if you have the fear of the Lord. And we see, out of, let's say out of ten of you, I'm just keep throwing it out, there may be nine of you with genuine fear of the Lord. But you always got that one that slips through the cracks. Always got that one who slips through the cracks. Read it again. The fear of the Lord goeth before the obtaining of authority. Mm-hmm. But roughness and pride... That roughness and pride is domination and intimidation. Go ahead. Is the losing thereof. You'll lose it. You, we got to take you down now. Give me Luke twenty two twenty four. 24. Luke twenty two twenty four. The book of Luke, chapter two, 22, verse 24. And there was also a strife among them. Which of them should be accounted the greatest? And he said unto them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. Y'all see that? The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them. That lordship goes back to uh, domination and intimidation. Go ahead. And they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. Because they receive benefits. Go ahead. But ye shall not be so. Christ said, you should, don't act like the kings of the Gentiles, where you exercise lordship over the people. Remember, it says in Peter, don't be lords over the flock. Go ahead. That's talking about intimidation, intimidation, intimidation and domination. Go ahead. But he that is greatest among you. But he that is greatest among you. Go ahead. Let him 
be as the younger. Let him be as the younger. Read. And he that is chief, mm -hmm. as he that doth serve. Read. For whether it is greater, he that sitteth at meat, or he that serveth, is not he that sitteth at meat. But I am among you as he that serveth. Now that's a hard saying for some black people. It's very hard to become a servant to the people. But that's what we truly are, servants to the people. Okay? Our job is to take care of them, their spiritual needs, as well as the physical in terms of food, clothing, shelter, things like that. That is our job. That is our job. Give me um, 1 Corinthians 12, 14. 1 Corinthians 12, 14. The book of 1 Corinthians, chapter 12 and verse 14. For the body is not one member, but many. For the body, and if we talk about the body, it's talking about the body of Christ, which is the nation of Israel. It's not one member. That's why I keep saying, this truth ain't about me. This truth ain't about one man. If you're in, a, uh, uh, if in your school, whatever state it is, you need a council set up of Trust of, of brothers that fear the Lord and know the scriptures. And if they, if y'all can't figure it out, you go up the chain of command. I'm going to say it again. You go up the chain of command. Let me tell you what a bad leader does. This happened in Austin where there was a confusion. And rather than go up the chain of command, he gets all the young men in the congregation in the, con in the, in the council. And I'm telling him, I said, you're a freaking idiot. And you did that on purpose. Why go to young men who really don't know the scriptures to manipulate them in a situation? You're supposed to go up the chain of command. I saw that dude had the devil on him back then. Read that again. Verse 14. For the body is not one member, but many. The body is not one member, but many. This is about a body, us as a collective. Go ahead. If the foot shall say, because I am not the hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I am not the eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole hit were hearing, where were the smelling? So Paul is trying to teach us here how to work well together. Why do you have to give this to the Corinthians? Because they did not work well together. And this is what organization is all about. Trying to get the members in the body to work well one with another. Having up various departments, okay? Everybody understand that you need various departments to work out various, uh, various activities like we went over today. And that was just an example on a lower level. And it's going to get bigger as time goes on. Read. What verse you at? Verse 18, sir. Uh -huh. But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. I want you to highlight verse 18. But now hath God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. That's why I said earlier, I don't know if y'all were paying attention. You cannot manipulate or force yourself into a position you're not ready for. It's going to be destruction. Major destruction on your part and the congregations. You want to sit in a seat that God has not ordained for you yet. You can, you can write down the word yet. We're not saying never, but not now. If you're struggling as a soldier or officer of 10, don't push for be a 50. Don't do that. Because the higher you get, the more responsibility is given to you. If you are struggling in your seat as a soldier or an officer of 10 or an officer of 20, don't ask for the 50 tests. Don't do that. Read. What verse you at? Verse 19. Mm -hmm. And if they were all one member, where were the body? Mm -hmm. But now are they many members, yet but one we body. We are many members here in IUIC, but we're still one body. Read. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again the head to the feet. I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. You know what Paul is saying in essence? There's one word, it's called, uh, it starts with an S. Uh, I'll, I'm going to use the word unity because I can't think of the word. Solidarity, thank you, that's the word. Solidarity, unity. 
That's what Paul, the Apostle Paul, is trying to teach the Corinthians. Work well together in your respective positions. And he used a, a man's body to help them understand it on a, on a, on, on a carnal level. Because in the spirit, they couldn't understand it. So we had to break it down for them in a the body. Read on. Verse 23. And those members of the body, which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. Mm -hmm. them, part, them brothers or sisters that you think are, are, are smaller in the, in the spirit or feeble, the body, Paul says, no, give them more abundant comeliness. That's how they are. You got to see them. very Because if you take away your toe, your stance of balance is off kilter. A toe, a small, your pinky toe will throw your balance off if you get rid of that thing. So you see a brother or sister you think is small, you, they're very necessary. Very necessary for the body. And that's what Paul is trying to get us to understand. Go ahead. What verse uh, you at? Verse 24. Mm -hmm. For our comely parts have no need, but God had tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. Right. He gave more abundant honor to that part that lacked. Like I remember, uh, remember the, Barnab where's Barnabas? Where's he at? Captain Bond. Remember there was a brother that said, me no sweep floors. I don't clean bathroom. That's beneath, that's beneath me, man. But I'll praise to the Lord. Once he looked at it spiritual. And that's what Paul is saying. Those, those type of things, you, they are very necessary. for Somebody, when we came in, we cleaned the bathroom. We watered the plant because we had plants in the school. We watered the plants. We vacuumed the, uh, the po podium. We did that thing. We cleaned the toilets, and we wasn't nobody. We was nobody, but the Lord said, you know what? Them spirits right there, this, this, this one, that one, this one. Let's raise them up later on in, in time, in time. Read on. What verse you at? Verse 25. That there should be no schism in the body. See that? That there should be no schism in the body. Come on. But that the members should have the same care one for another. We got to have that same sincere care one for another. Read. And whether one member suffer, mm -hmm. all the members suffer with it. When we hear brothers in a hospital or sisters, we want to know about it. You men in positions of leadership, that's something you should not keep secret from us. Why keep it secret? Didn't we just have an issue with that? Can you speak on that? Yeah, we straightened that out, though. But, uh, yeah, there was a, a situation where uh, one of the senior men of one of the schools was admitted into the hospital and he informed his uh, man under him, and, it's, and he kept it within, I guess, a uh, few of them, but it never got up to the captains, the, the deacons, or anybody. And we had to have a, a discussion on that to fix that up. So we got it straight, Bishop. We got it straight. We took care of it. Right, but that wasn't my point. My point was the importance. Oh, absolutely, because if something happens to him, what happens to the school? What happens to all of the people that know about the brother? All of us are going to be involved in it at that point. So the point was that information, that channel of information on something like that. Because it, Read it again in case y'all missed it. Verse 26. Mm -hmm. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it. That's the point. If you suffering, we suffering. We want to know about it. We want to help in whatever capacity we can. Everybody understand that? We don't. Or one member be honored. All the members rejoice with it. Right. So if it's good news, we want to hear about it so we can rejoice with you. All praises. Brother, get a new house. All praise the Lord. You know, read. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And, and so we're all part of the body of Christ. So again, I'm going to take a, a page out of what Deacon Abbey else once said. You don't want to find yourself. You don't want to be the finger that wants to be the hand. Don't be the foot that wants to be the leg. And don't be the ass that wants to be the eye. Does everybody understand that? So finally, the best leaders in this truth, you might not be the smartest or the most highly skilled, but you're going to be the one that inspires brothers and sisters to be their best. Everybody understand that? I give all praise to the Lord. All right. Shalom. We used to scream black power while Heron was pushed. But at the end of the day, nothing's in vain. 
IUIC has been given a vision. The tents of Judah has risen. Many has attempted the mission. Minor murmuring, omitting, and missing the mark. Just reading that he had the flame of fire in his eyes gave us the spark. We on Paul's mission. We out on the road, purple and gold. From Mexico, Cuba, Haiti, Ghana, Sierra Leone. 144,000 boots banging, concrete crackling. These are our men repented at heart. The scriptures is proof. IUIC, we deliver the truth.